If beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, what does the vision see? Man reincarnates his vision in the MCU. What's up guys, it's your boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was Reborn in the MCU as Vision? Part 1. Like, share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Warning, 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 assimilation failed rerouting auxiliary power source failed what the hell are they saying? Sustaining residual consciousness through foreign entity successful can you guys keep it down for a second? I'm trying not to wake up. Fusing residual consciousness with foreign entity failed reattempting fusion process failed reattempting fuss failed failed if I hear another sickening word. I swear I'm going to break Simon's head in this morning. I groaned in satisfaction as I felt my body still stiff giving me hope that I can return to my sleep peacefully without any time lags. I was about to drift off again into sleep when I heard the unmistakable sound of gunshots and explosions. What the fuck is Simon doing in my house? I wanted to push myself off my bed, but my body didn't respond. Okay, bod, I know we're currently not on the same page, but I'm sure you understand that someone's being real patriotic right about now, possibly inside my house. My heart chilled as the crashing and breaking sounds got louder. Alternate power source is advised to complete assimilation. I didn't even care about who said that, since all I wanted was to get off my bed and show my American patriotism to whoever was singing the hood anthem by reaching for the gun in my drawers. The noise got louder, and I heard shouts and what I pictured as perfect chaos. Damn you, Simon. I don't know what's happening, but I know it's your fault. I tried moving my body, but I was completely static, not even a breath was leaving my nose. I was somehow weirdly sure of that. My feeling of danger intensified when I felt a thud above me. It further skyrocketed when I heard the distinguishable sound of thunder coming from above me, none of these events giving me any comfort. And then what I hoped wasn't what was going to happen happened. Power overload. Critical power source identified. Assimilation pushed against former calculated limits. Absorbing and redistributing excess energy across material body and foreign entity. Reaction detected. What the hell is all this? My rising panic with this weird situation kept rising as everything felt jumbled up. Images, noise, weird sensations all came together in a painful mush and was stuck inside my head. The foreign entity has enforced a change. Assimilation complete. A change has begun. And then everything stopped. What the fuck is going on? After the most trippy experience I've ever had in my life, counting even the time I mixed cocaine and weed in Aunt Miriam's Thanksgiving pasta, yeah. I just couldn't stay still after hearing all that. I don't think Simon is to blame for all this. Pushing myself bursting through whatever had restrained me. I was met with a room full of bewildered faces that I was sure matched mine. Identity scanned. As if like another twisted type of joke, a few gigabytes of data were immediately downloaded in my head with an astonishing speed of 10 GB per second in less than a fraction of a second. What I wouldn't give to have this kind of connection on my PC. My gaze met with that of a hunking Goldilocks that I was still having trouble believing was real. As if on impulse. My body moved towards him, acting on a stray thought, only to have it caught and thrown away. Okay, time out. My body stopped abruptly in front of a glass panel, cueing me once again that I was already defying the laws of physics, as the momentum was just killed off, or rather absorbed by my body. My mind raced with a speed I have never been able to process information at, coming only to a singular conclusion. I'm in marvel, and looking at the red reflection with a jewel etched into the middle of my head, I was the overpowered yet massively sidelined AI android vision. New identity assigned. Designated name vision. Purpose dash. Unidentified. I ignored the ringing voice inside my head and focused once more on my reflection. To be perfectly honest, this was nowhere near an ideal form to be had. But it was the best in the room even when taking the residential god into account if it wasn't naked. Task generated. Completed. It was as if my entire actions up till now were automatic as a body fit shirt materialize over my body. And with that little need taken care of. 
I turned to around to be the recipient of shocked and uncertain gazes. Some outcry even contained fear and regret already blooming. The whole experience from the last few minutes seemed surreal that I really was an android in Marvel, but my brain, or whatever it is that was up there, downplayed it by, like, a lot. Here, I was flying, without any emission except the slight air drafts whenever I moved, and the Avengers stood in front of me. I just noticed, but all my haywire thoughts have been neutralized even since I woke up, and the numerous amounts of data constantly pouring, left my expression to be less than desired. I came down and stood in front of them taking in their appearances and also the awkwardness of the situation. I don't really know what to say this definitely is odd. That didn't seem to assuage them, but instead made them even wary as they stared at me. Thor, you helped create this. Steve Rogers queried his Nordic teammate. I had a vision. Thor turned to them. A whirlpool that sucks in all of life, and its center is that. He pointed at the stone lodged in my forehead. The gem. Bruce asked. The mind stone, Thor clarified, one of the six infinity stones. The greatest power in the universe, unparalleled in its destructive capabilities. Way to go and spoil everything. My mind was busy copulating and comprehend terabyte loads of data as the conversation went on. Why would you bring Dash? Because Stark is right. Thor interjected Steve, causing Banner to groan in as Reality Kane checking in. Oh, it's definitely the end times. You possibly don't have any idea how right you are, I muttered. But it seemed they heard since everyone was quiet and trading glances between me. Thor and Steve. New identity assigned. Foreign entity designated name Mindstone. Purpose calculating. The Avengers cannot defeat Ultron. Not alone. I said, keeping their attention on me. A lot of thoughts were going through my mind as the amount of data in it piled up in droves by the second. Why does your vision sound like Jarvis? Steve asked confused. We reconfigured Jarvis's matrix to create something new. He looked at me with an unsure expression on his face. I think I've had my fill of something new. You think I'm born of Ultron. Despite the fact that I was currently computing data greater than all the systems in the entire building combined, I was but a human a few minutes ago. Or I think I was. Was it really a few minutes ago? Are you not? The captain asked unconvinced. I am not Ultron. It was the most logical answer I could derive. I am not Jarvis. My directives, though born from Stark's programming were entirely different. Did I have a soul? I guess I wouldn't be able to tell if I had one. I am who am I? I wasn't even trying to be funny or systematic with that question. Who am I? Designated name vision that it was. But whose vision? Mine. The Avengers. Anthony Stark's. The Mind Stone. Ultron's. Whose idea was I perfectly embodying? You don't know who you are, Banner asked. I slowly shook my head. Whatever it was that was happening really was getting to me. Likely because of my now systematic and semi-mechanic origins and thought functions. I guess to you. I asked back. I looked in your head and saw annihilation. Wanda said, her distrust palpable even from this distance. Look again. The scenarios and current flow of events were exactly identical to that of the movies. At least I had a crutch to help me gain a footing before I can walk on my own. Her seal of approval means Jack to me. Barton dismissed probably still salty about how Wanda Minfic the rest of the Avengers. Their powers, the horrors in our heads, Ultron himself, all came from the Mind Stone, and they are nothing compared to what it can unleash. Thor was probably defending me, or the Mind Stone having sentient host, I wasn't sure. But with it on our side Dash, is it? Are you? On our side. Steve directed at me. Am I? Vision gained his own directives by being in the side of life, which eventually made him more robot-like unknown to anyone. By being on the side of life, Vision's thought process became more linear. And he would always prioritize the people over everything else. Always. I wouldn't know. I don't think it's that simple for me. I finally said. Well, it better get real simple real soon. Purpose dash, unidentified. I gave a glance at the prompt. Ultron seeks to end all life. I'd rather it be preserved. Thankfully that seemed to take them off the edge. At least for a while. What's he waiting for? Stark asked. You. I replied. Where? Sokovia. He's got Nat there too. Barton interrupted before I had the chance to say anything. The thrill I would have felt upon being reincarnated in a new world. And one like Marvel was desperately underwhelming. All thanks to my now robotic build. Banner walked forward and stood in front of me. If we're wrong about you, if you are the monster that Ultron made you to be, you'd kill me. I said plainly. It wasn't a surprise. 
I'd want to kill an independent AI with unclear goals if I ever met one. And besides, this was Marvel, not DC. Heroes here don't like prisons all too much. I understand your fears, your worries even more. If I really am a monster, then I'd say we all aren't that much different. If I'm not, then at least I'm not Ultron. They all fell silent my words which suggested I was aware of their true nature. Old nature. I am not Vision, not the one Tony envisioned. Not the one Ultron dreamed of. I'll be my own Vision, at least a version that's true to me. Purpose dash, unidentified. But until then, I'll just live as I can. Turning around, I saw Mjolnir resting atop a table, and a thought came to me. Vision was worthy of welding the hammer, not because he was robotic, but because he chose life above all else, same with Rogers. Will I be able to pick it up? Unlike the movie scene, they all looked at me as I stared fixatedly at the hammer, and watched on with intrigue on what I wanted to do. My hand held the handle of Mjorna, and for a moment I thought I was holding a rock before it became as light as a book. They were all stunned to silence as I picked up the hammer, and it took all my computing powers to maintain the calm facade I had been putting on since the beginning. Ultron is the sin of mankind. It'll take more than a man to stop him. Thor stared at the hammer held in front of him, and reluctantly took it from my hand. The Mind Stone has influenced the change. Purpose be the vision you dream. I walked away from them, leaving them to plan whatever they wanted, while I tended to my own thoughts. It had only been a few minutes since I woke up, and yet I was about to go fight Ultron. Dealt with an existential crisis, surviving a group of paranoid Avenger, had an object of limitless power cruising on my forehead, and also being reincarnated in another world. My feet left the ground as I flew towards a huge glass panel and looked down at the city. Become a vision of my dreams. Huh? I was strong. I could be rich if I wanted, but that was vain, and it held no value to someone like me. What then should I do? Hopefully I'll find out soon enough. I looked at my own reflection in the glass panel. While my mind ran through the data I've acquired, tabulate all data into categories and level of importance. Task generated. Completed having the fastest computer on Earth for a brain was really useful. It immediately cleared all the clogs of data and neatly arranged them in folders and tabs. It was somehow weird seeing things in zeros and ones, and also being able to switch between my vision mode. With that I pulled up the information on the stone in my head. Mind stone purpose dash calculating it was still calculating which wasn't surprising as the stone was a material aspect of the infinite universe. There was no way my system, no matter how sophisticated it was, could unravel the mysteries of the Mind Stone so soon. I mentally pulled on a tab listed as known Abilitius and whistled as I saw what was listed there. Flight Molecular Deconstruction Phasing Energy Projection Energy Absorption Psychic Interference Immunity Technopathy Density Manipulation Vision was busted in every way. Still, it was kind of weird how quickly I adapted to the body of a machine, a semi-machine. Vision's body was created with a perfect synthesis of biological cells and vibranium, making him one of the most physically strongest people in the room, only losing to Thor and Hulk. Also his density manipulation allowed him to either increase or decrease his weight, making him hit even harder, and mixing that with his energy assimilation, he could further boost his physical strength with every punch. I didn't dive too much into the internet since Ultron was already there. I could even feel his static from here, buzzing with every internet connection. Right now the Battle of Sokovia was just a few hours from starting. And I knew this was where everything turned to shit for the rest of the Avengers timeline. If not for Wanda losing it due to Petro's death, and allowing an Ultron droid to push the proverbial button no, there was no way it could be stopped. Ultron activated his device the moment the Avengers landed, and there was no way they could destroy it due to the presence of civilians in the city it truly is inevitable. Hum. I turned my head slightly and caught a confused stare from Wanda. Great. Another complication. Unlike Vision from the comics and movies, I could understand human emotions, know that they knew, so I understood the complications that came with them. Due to possessing the Mind Stone, Wanda was naturally drawn to me due to its interference with her awakening. From what I could tell, there was no romantic feeling from her, which was mainly due in the first place because of her losing her brother and seeking comfort from the one thing she was drawn to Vision. It did blossom into pure love, which later turned obsessive due to her losing her lover. In other words, complications. Best to think about it later. 
I have to say that Steve Rogers was one hell of a hype man. His speech on the plane was blood raising, if I had one. It did serve to get everyone into the mood though. Maybe I can suggest being a MC if he wants to retire because he'll be damn good at parties. I ignored the few glances Wanda threw at me throughout the whole flight. It wasn't that I didn't find her attractive or anything like that. But it had been less than a day since I found myself in this situation. And besides, I wanted to see how she would act if her brother didn't die prematurely. Yes, saving Quicksilver was the only solid plan I had. Task generated greater than save Petro Maximoff from any instance of death status. Ongoing my AI definitely wasn't an all-powerful system. And it would have been weird if me as a robot had a system that wasn't my doing. Mine was just something I subconsciously created. Kind of like Jarvis, or I guess Friday now, is to Stark. Our first priority is getting the civilians out of the city as soon as possible. We all went our separate ways, Banner to find Natasha, Thor and Stark on looking for Ultron and stopping whatever it is he was planning, while the rest of them focused on getting the civilians out of the city as soon as possible. Me, I was on overview. Petro Maximoff running speed, 1246 meters per second the boy was fast, but given how it hasn't been long since they acquired their powers, I could see why his reaction was slow. I saw Iron Man flying towards the church, and my scanners told me Ultron was already inside, so I made my way there too. So far I had been following the script I could remember, because what was important was sealing off Ultron's escape through the internet. Once that was done everything else could go to shit. And that was Iron Man being blasted out of the building. Ultron, I called out. They really did take everything from me. He said as he flew to meet me Madeir. It was never yours you. For a sentient machine code, Ultron felt more human, at least more human than Vision ever was. My words provoked him as intended, and he rushed at me, giving me the opening I needed to grab his head, and cut off his connection to anything other than his robot army. My head felt dizzy at the impossibly large amount of data flooding it, and I knew I needed to do something about it, unless I'd be forced to black out for a few minutes. I just conquered man's internet after all. Reroute the influx of data through the mind stone. Vision in the movies had no idea what the stone he carried around in his head could do. None of the Avengers did, but gladly. I wasn't one of them. What kind of information could possibly fill the Mind Stone? You lock me out? You think I care? He was outraged and rushed at me. But it wasn't as if he was the only machine here. Muscle density dash 10 tons. I punched him so hard that he copied his creator and crashed a trench outside the cathedral. Hum. It's not yet activated. Stark. On it robots had started crawling out of the city through every crevice. And since Ultron had not yet activated his meteor there was a chance we could salvage this. And besides, there was a fuckton of vibranium lying underneath this church. Guess, I'll have to work for my pay. Oh look, Junior is already learning. Keep the robots and Ultron away from the key. I said through the comms, alerting all the Avengers of what they should look out for. Worst case scenario, Stark asked, was standing on Ultron's meteor. He touches this thing and the city flies. There could be worst ways to go, not with the amount of magnetically supercharged vibranium under the city. One wrong move and it's another extinction level event. But this time it won't be the dinosaurs. Saying my piece, I flew towards Ultron who groaned in a very upsetting lifelike manner. He fired off a few laser blasts to throw me off. But I dodged them and fell into the ground, phasing through it only to blindside him with the cleanest uppercut anyone has ever seen. While Ultron sailed through the air, I had to stop my chase to destroy the few bots that were making their way toward the cathedral. I dissected one from top to bottom with a laser beam from the Mind Stone, while the others were crushed to smithereens. Guys, Junior wasn't lying. One button push and the city flies. A few hundred kilometers and it'll level Sokovia. Over 10,000 and the continent will sink like the Ice Age Stark's affirmation was all they needed to move like possessed zombies, making their way back and circling a perimeter around the cathedral. Clint, you and the Maximoff twins should focus on evacuating as many people as you can. Thor, Stark and I will focus on the perimeter break while Vision will draw Ultron where's Nat and Bruce. Hearing the captain, they all got to work, not questioning the man because he was just that Riz. Unlike the movies, the city didn't lift off which meant we currently had an army of Ultron-controlled robots making their way towards us. Estimated count-3718 identified hostiles. Let's take them to church, shall we? Boom. I broke the sound barrier pretty easily while phasing through and destroying over a dozen robots before getting to Ultron. He magnetically pulled in a car and flung it towards me. 
but I just phased through it and headbutted him, throwing him off his balance, and followed it up with a 10 tons punch. That wrecked his inner circuits. Leave me alone. A lot of robots started firing sporadically, putting the civilians in their crosshairs, which forced the human members of the Avengers to take cover, while Ultron took the chance to clear a considerable distance from me. Tony Stark POV seeing the fully sentient android he had wanted for Jarvis to inhabit, Tony couldn't help but feel a little irritated. Vision, as he called himself, was strong. He pummeled his way literally through any robot that were in his sights with maximum efficiency, that it looked somehow pitiful. One thing he was thankful for was that the overpowered robot was on their side, and had also helped them in locking Ultron away from the internet. It's a bit worrying, you know. He heard Steve say, What is? The fact that Ultron could have had that and more. Steve's tone had an edge to it which told Tony that he hadn't forgotten his mistake yet. It was just too apparent at this point. Well, what can I say? I'm just one lucky guy. Rug. The roar of the green beast alerted them of the new arrival, who had already begun rampaging through the city, tearing apart any robot that wasn't red and gold. Tony took to the air, giving him a high enough vantage point for the ensuing chaos. Boss, there are a few people trapped near the bridge well. Like Junior said, time to earn a pay. Flaring his thrusters, he took off towards the highlighted location, while performing tight air maneuvers to throw off and destroy the robots who impeded his way. Vision POV mark all the robots with the slightest static in them, and alert me if any makes an attempt to flee the city. Task generated greater than prevent any robot from escaping the city perimeter's status. Ongoing a lot of red dots came alive on the mini HUD at a small corner of my vision, and with it, I could tell what place had the highest amount of congestion, and was in dire need of a trimming. The area around the cathedral was a trigger zone, and would immediately blare an alarm to me, if one of them got dangerously close enough. Not surprisingly, Iron Man was engaged in a family feud with Ultron, and the two of them were currently duking out their frustrations with the other, while I made my way towards a congested area. I landed near Barton, the latter trading only a glance with me before he took a direction, and left the others for me. I ran a few calculations in my head, and with a little help from the Mind Stone, I charged up my hands with yellow electricity, and blasted it towards the group of incoming robots, frying their circuits as they dropped dead. Nice trick. Barton sounded impressed. But that was it as he made his way to another location. I was about doing the same when I sensed someone hiding in a house, human. I moved towards the house and opened the door only to stifle a sigh as I saw a scared wonder. Surprisingly, this isn't cliche. Let me guess, stage fright. I heard it's a common thing among humans. I said in a bid to lighten the atmosphere which worked. At least I think it did, since her heartbeat did slow down a bit. No one will blame or criticize you if you decide to sit this one out. Someone as innocent as you shouldn't have a place in a war zone. A few alerts bled to life, indicating that a few robots were trying to leave the city. But it looks like Thor was on them. If you'll excuse me, I turned around intending to leave. But I heard something that made me smile a bit. I'm not innocent. Her voice was low. But I heard it clearly. I gave a half look, no one is before taking off to keep the heat off Thor's back or not. Seems like he's more capable than I thought. Estimated count-3011 identified hostiles. The Messiah, Ultron POV, everything stopped going as planned as so soon as that imposter entered the playing board. Not only usurping my body, but also taking away what should have been mine by right of conquest. Well, no matter. If my cards aren't nice, then I'll just have to reshuffle the deck. First start off by taking care of the weakest links. Since they want to protect the feeble humans so much, then how about I just let them do that? A classic case of stalking the cicada and not knowing of the aureole behind. But in this case, I'm the cicada and the aureole. I cut my strings, so I'm free my picks were Natasha, Clint Barton and Petro Maximoff. Of those three, Natasha and Petro were the easiest picks since Natasha dying. Hopefully means a rampaging Hulk, and a dead Petro means an out of control Wanda. I just need a little bit of friendly fire and everything is good. I need them to leave the perimeter of the church, so I can activate my extinction bomb. But I think that Vision is keeping an eye on it. It honestly doesn't matter all that much. I'll get in sooner or later. Let's get this show started, shall we? Vision POV, I wonder what Simon would say if he saw me now. Probably would test if I'm bulletproof before anything else. 
I thought idly as I destroyed two robots near me. There were no end to these things. Estimated count-2823 identified hostile sure the numbers were dwindling, but so were the stats of the Avengers. If this dragged on further, a list of members would risk suffering fatality, and that list included Barton, Natasha, the Maximoff twins, and even Steve. Only the Hulk and Thor, and me too, could shrug off the accumulating fatigue that was slowly creeping in. Guess there's quite a few perks that comes with having the perfect scientifically constructed body. I landed back at the cathedral and looked at the metallic trigger construct made of vibranium. A lot of things could go wrong if this thing was pushed. Scanning a quarter ton of magnetically charged vibranium are buried for a few kilometers under this church. Is there a way to shut it down? Preferably everything. Calculating affirmative seeing the listed suggestion my processor could come up with. I immediately got to work. I carefully tore a hole around the contraption, careful enough to miss it, and went under. I came face to face with a gigantic monolithic structure of pure vibranium, and also a lot of vibranium inside supercharged chambers. The structure works on the constant energy being generated by the vibranium cores. It is advised to absorb the energy from the cores to fully render the structure immobile got it. Run all influx of energy my body can't handle through the mind stone. It'll help bolster the assimilation coefficient quite easily. Normally, it would have been impossible for someone to use the mind stone like this. But since my abilities come from it, accessing it becomes basic. It's also what holds my code and the sentience that come with it or at least the former vision. Add that to my tab. Task generated greater than investigate the bond between your sentience and the entity known as the Mindstone status. Pending play some upbeat music while you're at it. I'm about to do something really chad. I almost let out a laugh as I saw the huge amount of robots running towards the church. Ultron must have known what I was about to do since he pretty much pulled a kamikaze on everybody, including himself. Vision, what are you doing? He looks absolutely pissed off. I believe you humans call it a Uno reverse or something along those lines, Captain. Oh, Ultron was getting done with this. This was his own personalized broadcast band. Basically, it was his signal tower. Take this down, and he'll lose control of almost, if not all, his robots. He might be able to brute force his way into a new body. But that way everyone would know. With the uptown beat singing in my head, I grabbed the machine and gasped as energy ran through me like a lightning rod. Further synthesis has been triggered due to large influx of magnetic and electrical properties, and its effects on your vibranium body. You can now slightly alter the effects they have on you. Further data is required to increase and manipulate electromagnetic properties of vibranium. It felt as if my head started swelling as every excess energy made their way to the mind stone. If it wasn't for my enhanced vibranium body, I probably would have exploded and caused a chain reaction that would have swallowed the city. The moment I finished absorbing the energy from the charged vibranium cores, the negative feedback from the lack of positively charged electrons sent a citywide emp wave that knocked out the army of Ultron bots. Estimated count-0001 identified hostile and that's checkmate. At the surface, the Avengers faced off against a highly infuriated Ultron and his extra aggressive army of killer robots as they prevented him from reaching the cathedral. You think this pitiful stand means anything? History has always shown true by repeating itself. Even if I fall, one greater than I will come. We know. It's the reason why the battle never ends. There will always be someone like you in every era, and people like us to stand against you the dreams we fear becomes a nightmare after all. Steve countered Ultron's words with his as he blocked a punch from the android with his shield. Then wake up and face reality. You sicken me. Just then, a wave spread throughout the city and knocked out the entire army of robots, leaving only Ultron to stand against the Avengers. In the end, it's only you against them. A voice drew their attention as they saw Vision flying out of the crevice and facing Ultron. And why do you think that is? Dash. Ultron's words permanently ceased as Hulk slammed him against the ground and stomped hard on him until the last dregs of light left his eyes. Vision POV. Is that it? Petro asked in surprise as the section of the city they were in fell dead silent at Ultron's death. You could say he put all his eggs inside one basket. Unfortunately for him, he left it terribly unguarded. Handling Ultron had honestly been easy as there was no way the android could take on all of the Avengers. That was the reason why he had been using distractions, taking them out one by one by their weakest links. This is going to be a huge mess guys. We'll have the UN and EU breathing down on our necks for this. Natasha said, reminding everyone of why this had happened in the first place. And not to mention even if she didn't say it. 
I knew who she was referring to me. It wouldn't take a genius to know how they'd be guarded to let another sentient AI walk around with autonomy after what just happened. Well, I'm sure the coming days will be hectic for everyone here, so best not to fret on it right now. We still have work to do. I could deal with the complications that come with me being a robot later. But now there were a lot of rescue operations needed. He's right. Best to leave the cleaning up to us while you bunch get ready. I hear the president's already got 23 others in a phone call. Fury's voice sounded over from the comms and my open communication system before he pulled up on a helicarrier. We'll help. We can't leave just this to you guys. Thanks Fury, Steve said. There were thousands of killer robots, both in scattered and pristine conditions, laid all over the city. They couldn't just leave them to be laying around, not after what happened after the invasion. And also, we are literally standing on a treasure trove. No one here would trust the government with that much vibranium. I already got cleaners coming in. We'll wrap up all the Ultron parts and then focus on how we are going to drill that thing out, Stark said. We cleaned up the city from all the robot parts we could find, while those from S.H.I.E.L.D. ran first aid for the injured, and counted the death toll. The people the destruction hit the most amongst us were no doubt the Maximoff twins. This was where they were born and where they were raised. Seeing such death and destruction brought upon it, and remembering their hand in it brought the two of them down in tears, once the adrenaline wore off. Wanda appeared to be particularly hit with the realization, but thankfully was handling it well with her brother supporting her. It made me wonder how she dealt with all the grief in the original plotline. Losing her home and her last blood while also being a cause for all the deaths surely would have taken a great toll on her fragile mind state. Nothing was more worse than repressed grief after all. I did help with the rescue effort, since it was physically impossible that the Avengers were able to cover the entire city during all the chaos. It wasn't a pretty sight. It was more surprising for me how I was able to remain calm during everything that had happened in less than 24 hours. The entire experience felt somehow foreign, and at the same time felt like a great regret for me. I was human, at least part of one, and yet it felt as if I was anything but. It wasn't as if the emotions weren't there. They were. I could clearly feel them but they felt more like an option, should I choose to feel them or not. And while it might sound a bit dark and unfeeling, I'd rather not know how that grief, fear and trauma feels like for a normal human. You've been quiet for a while now. What bothers you? Thor came to me and stood at my side as we both stood at a hillside and overlooked the ruined city, the result of a moral squabble, an ill-fought battle. It's a regret something like this ever happened in the first place. He said. I nodded. The reason for the battle was stupid. The event leading to it even more so. Ego. That was all it was. It was also the reason why the Avengers broke up. Will you be leaving soon? I asked. Yes. Two Infinity Stones have shown up in the past few years. I feel something is amiss in the cosmos. He said. I see. Though I knew he'd be leaving. I was slightly regretful because he was my favorite Avenger, even more so after knowing them. Your presence will be missed. Ha <laughs> ha. Not so much, I think. Besides, they'll have you. A worthy ally. He stretched out his hands towards me for a shake, and I responded in kind, by grabbing his arm, Viking style, which earned me a grin from him. Keep an eye on them for me. They're quite the bunch. It's my fortune to meet such comrades in my time. He said before twirling his hammer and flying away. After a few minutes, I sighed as I got tired of the view, and started making my way back to the States. I was just thankful I could avoid the two things that worried me in this battle. I ignored the notifications of completed tasks, opting to focus on them after I've properly cooled off. Scanning complete acquired the Ultron Code conclusion. Assimilation of the Ultron Code will increase synergy with the Mind Stone Shelve. That for later. There were a lot of things I needed to think of from this point onwards. First of all, I was an Avenger. That was the best outcome of this whole bizarre experience. As an Avenger and also as the Vision, what was it I wanted to accomplish? The complications of being a fully sentient android. The three-way connection between me, the Mind Stone and Wanda. And now, what was I going to do with the Ultron code I acquired? I don't even know what it was. I need a 24 hours power down. Like expected, the outrage the Avengers faced after the event of the Battle of Sokovia was nothing like anyone had ever seen. It was surprising how they could continue being heroes, despite how much the public seemed to hate, mostly the citizens of Sokovia. Sokovia was practically a no Avengers allowed zone at this point. Would have been a kill on sight if they had the power. 
There were a lot of negative comments from the international space about the unsupervised movement of the Avengers, and talks were already being put into order to see what could be done about it. But fortunately, or unfortunately, it wasn't an easy decision to come to. Whether they liked it or not, the Avengers were the strongest known fighting unit the planet had, and putting them under any single country's banner would be akin to giving them extra ammunition in both the international market and military places. No country would agree to that. Luckily for the Avengers, this was their much-needed smokescreen. Not that most of them were privy to it. Vision POV sleeping in an android's body was very weird. All I felt was just as if my senses became slow before they rebooted again. One thing for sure was that it was nowhere as comfortable as a human's sleep. The fact that I couldn't get tired due to my mechanical body rendered sleep completely useless. What a tragedy. My cold heartstrings tugged as I lamented. Good morning Vision. I am Friday a female's mechanical voice was the first thing that resounded in my head as I opened my eyes. Stark's AI assistant. You are correct. Boss said to notify you when you were done with your beauty sleep. I'll be down there in a few minutes. The presence of Stark's AI receded from my room before I let out a sigh. Well, no use moping over what I've already come to terms with. I materialized a shirt over my body. A little trick that was quite easy. Seeing as how it was just a little modification of my vibranium exterior, to the texture I wanted and a touch of coloring. I walked towards the door and directly phased through it before I paused. It seems like logical reasoning was not always the right thing to do. As a human, opening the door was the norm while a computer with the option of phasing through it will choose the latter. Since it's more time efficient and requires less effort, it's always the little things. Friday pointed out the direction to me, and I followed it, and came to a lounge with all the members of the Avengers there, even Thor who still hasn't left yet. Hey, greetings. Some looked a bit awkward to see me here, not that I could blame them. But it wasn't anything severe, just most likely another bizarre experience in their resume. I wasn't informed of a meeting taking place. Petro and Wanda were absent, most likely still asleep, meaning I was the only new insert here. It's not. This, Stark said pointing at everybody, is what we call coincidence. Yes, I am quite familiar with the term, and also the unlikely probability of it happening right now. He got you there, Stark, Barton said with a smirk. We need to know something, Steve started. Now that Ultron is gone, what do you want to do? He asked. That's quite a leap. Are you sure it's wise to give such autonomy of expression to something alien? I asked back. I believe that will be up to us for assessment, came his immediate reply. But I have to say that regardless of your choice, you'll be under a supervision, at least for a probationary period. I nodded at his words. It would be foolish of them to let such advanced weaponry capable of self-thought and radical decision-making to wander around unsupervised. It is something I know I will have to deal with, at least for the time being. Well, we can just say he one of Dash, he's not one of yours, Tony. Steve immediately cut him off. Stark raised his hands in defeat and just took a drink from the table and quietly sipped. And what about the two of them? I take it that such treatment is also applicable to them. He nodded. They are young, naive and driven by revenge. I don't believe it's fair to saddle them with mistakes that were ours in the first place regardless of their participation. It's too much a burden to bear on one so young. I have to say, it's hard to hate someone like Steve. His charisma and righteous character made him easily trustable, especially when you knew how genuine he was. Well, you can say I'm still on a path of self-discovery. Having allies around me, I believe is the wiser choice. Thank you. I didn't lose anything by acquiescing to the suggestion they put forth. Instead, I had everything to gain. Since that's already sorted out, Fury wanted me to let you guys know that the news isn't exactly loving you guys. Natasha said, tapping on a tablet and bringing up a hologram of various news channels. Speaking of the atrocities suffered since the advent of the Avengers, and also the rise in crime rate and progressive inefficiency of the police. They are not wrong. We'll have to lay low for a bit and let Fury work his part. Tony is already in on it. The last thing we need is giving them a target to reignite their grief. Steve said, then I guess it's a good thing that I've been working on something. Call it plan C if you will. Stark said with a smile as he stood up. Anyone coming for the grand reveal? Not me. I have to get back to Laura. Kitchen's not going to refurbish itself. Barton declined the invitation for going home while the rest accepted. A few minutes flying and we came to a place that looked like a stupidly well-funded military base, with a gigantic A inscribed on the side of the building's dot, Welcome to Boot Camp. 
A few days had passed since the team relocated to where Tony had smartly dubbed boot camp before leaving Steve to take care of and run everything. Funny how a billionaire like him was bad with administration, so he had said. Unlike the original timeline, Natasha would not be a permanent resident of the compound, as she decided to leave with Bruce. Due to Vision's interference, the Hulk didn't get on the Quinjet. That would have probably yeeted him off to Saka through unexplained means. Though if that decision was final remained yet to be seen as Bruce was still hanging around the compound, completely out of his element. The second duo who were also completely out of their element, were no doubt the Maximoff twins Petro and Wanda. Their life had changed way too fast and too drastic, that it took them some time to start acclimating to the change. They were enjoying every moment of it so there was that. For the moment they were only doing some basic training under Steve and Natasha's guidance, since some fights just couldn't be fought from a distance. Despite the oddity of it, only one of them was needed to put the twins in their place during their spas. As for Vision, while he did join in the spas, it was very clear that he was a clear cut above the others even when taking Steve and Natasha into the equation. All he needed to do was download and synchronize the fighting styles of the various martial arts, while also streaming thousands of fighting videos of said arts on Earth, and he was already a seasoned fighter. The three of them weren't the only addition to the compound though. Sam Wilson, Falcon, and Colonel James Rhodes joined them, though the latter was more of a military advisor and liaison between the Avengers and the government. Will there be any changes to me if I assimilate the Ultron Code? Negative the Ultron Code is a series of binary computations that was the accumulation of the subjective consciousness known as Ultron. While there will be a change upon assimilation of the code, it can be easily suppressed, override or deleted assimilation is advised, I breathed out in relief upon hearing that. It wouldn't be nice if I had a mini Devil Ultron sitting on my shoulders at all times due to this change. I brought up the notifications I've gone through the past few days and looked at them again. Mindstone purpose dash calculating task generated greater than investigate the bond between your sentience and the entity known as the Mindstone status. Pending due to large influx of magnetic and electrical properties and its effects on your vibranium body. You can now slightly alter the effects they have on you. The Mind Stone could very well be the heart of my being, due to the way Vision was conceived, which made my growth dependent on it. It wasn't bad per se, but it also wasn't the best. Despite being biological, I was essentially designed to be a machine, which meant I needed a core like every other machine. Something as simple as an arc reactor would heavily handicap me, and render most of my abilities unusable. Trust me, I ran the numbers. So while having most of my existential growth hinging on the Mind Stone wasn't all good, it was also the best solution I had at the moment. Start the assimilation. Assimilating of the Ultron Code status. Ongoing estimated time. 13 hours 41 min. Since I had nothing to do other than wait, I decided to stretch my legs a little, which was obviously a human expression but I decided not to think too much about it. Existential crisis meant nothing when you had a supercomputer for a brain. Different from everybody else, the moment I scanned the entire compound was the moment I grew bored of it. It was unavoidable when I knew every nook and cranny of it, and it was forever imprinted on my mind in 16K. At least I still had taste buds, just don't ask me where the food went. Vision. I turned around to look at Wanda who called me. She was dressed in leather pants and a beige-colored shirt, covering her hair with a beanie. Wanda. I nodded at her, silently asking why she called me. My relationship with Wanda was as normal as it could be as it was with everyone here. She just felt some curiosity towards me. Still does, but she was polite enough not to make it known. Are you going somewhere? She asked. Yes. I was thinking of stretching my legs a bit. I said and made to leave but paused a bit. Do you want to tag along? At least some conversation should help pass the time before I decide to just shut myself down and be done with it. Sure. We walked for a bit before Wanda decided to break the silence, while I was mentally bopping to some tunes only I could hear. I don't think I've thanked you yet. What for? I asked in genuine confusion. I don't think we've been acquainted to the point that you'd owe me thanks. In Sokovia. Your words really did help me. I believe that's reason enough for me to thank you. Oh that, it's nothing. I believe you would have found your strength yourself even in that scenario. I don't think I honestly did anything. I don't think my words have as equal a value as your thanks. She looked at me for a while, 
before her eyes lit up in realization as she smiled faintly. I didn't need to be the super smart AI that I was to know she'd most likely arrived at a particularly wrong conclusion. Things like thanks and gratitude don't have corresponding value for anything, Vision. As long as you perceive someone's action to you as beneficial, there are ways to express your gratitude, in this case my thanks. I see. No, I don't see at all. After teaching me about the applications of thanks and gratitude, we spent over an hour together where we just talked, mostly her teaching me things. I don't know why, but it's almost a general consensus that I was lacking human emotions, or at least couldn't fully understand them, which I wouldn't blame them for, since it was inconceivable for a newly born sentient AI to have emotions. My initial observations outside of what I already knew was that she was a very nice girl. Naive, lied to, and misguided, but a nice girl overall. Petro, on the other hand, was hyperactive, perfectly in sync with his abilities. He was always willing to try new things, while also keeping an eye out for his sister at all times. How are you enjoying it here so far? I asked her after we found a place to sit. She remained silent for a few moments where I just sat and waited for her answer, and she gave it to me. Honestly, it's all we ever wanted. After we lost our parents, Petro and I just wanted to help the people of Sokovia so they will never have to feel that pain we felt. It didn't work out quite as well as we wanted, but it was okay, until she let out a depreciating chuckle as she remembered where that brought her and the people she wanted to help. Baron struck her, I read the files. She gave a humorless laugh and hung her head down. Greater than our zeal to help her pee up the people of Sokovia was our hope for revenge against Tony Stark. We always stood against whatever he did, no matter how small it was, even if it didn't concern us. I have never hated someone as I did the man who took my family from me. Hate. Such a wonderful emotion. The only human emotion that can completely destroy the feeling of love. She was not wrong to hate the man she thought was responsible for the death of her family. It was a very human thing to do. They were survivors. They had the right to choose how they feel. Do you still hate him? I don't know why I'm still here. But maybe, just maybe, she would not grow up to be crazy Wanda if I could help. It wasn't because she was a comic character turned real or an unstable and stupidly overpowered woman in the future. Right now she was just a girl learning how to properly grieve and let go. No, not hate. There is dislike, but not hate. It's unfair to blame him when he had nothing to do with that incident. She took a deep breath and rubbed her palms together. I'm learning to let go. And I believe that's an amazing thing to do. She smiled at me, one full of appreciation. I think the reason she opened up to me this easily is that, just like her, I'm new here and also intricately linked to the previous disaster. As if. It's not like I ever wish to be a sentient biomechanical advanced AI code. Well, you win some, you lose some. This, she pointed around us, is not something I ever thought I'd be a part of. It's both fulfilling and a chance for both of us. She said, me neither. Well, for my case, it's that I didn't know something like a future goal existed. Granted, I've only been alive for less than a week. She laughed at that. Was it funny? Or is my computer brain finding it hard to comprehend what light jokes are? Well, then dash a gust of wind blew around us and dissipated with Petro sitting beside Wanda. I'll be off. I finished. Sure, time hadn't passed that long. Not even an hour. But I figured maybe setting up a few future plans were needed. This was Marvel. I am Vision. The combination of those two were recurring doses of calamity. But where to start from? Tony Stark POV Vision. That was his name. Or what he chose for himself. I had made the choice to put life in Ultron's perfect body. And use it as my redemption. And also to put a stop to the never-ending battle. But he turned out different. He wasn't Jarvis like I'd expected. No, he was Jarvis. But Jarvis was just a very infinitesimal part of what he was. He is the product of Ultron's visions. My hope, Jarvis, whatever that mind stone was. And the best of what biological, mechanical and computer science had to offer. He is like an orphaned infant, not defenseless, but lacking in what to call his own. Hopefully he finds that with Steve. Friday, what's the synopsis? Vision's computing and logical processing neurons are way more advanced than anything I've ever seen. It's like he is truly alive, well, isn't that something? An android that's alive. Guess you and your siblings have some competition after all. I believe we do, what are you going to do about Vision, boss? Me? Nothing. Why should I even bother doing anything? Steve is going to take care of him until he is ready to fly. So, an independent robot? Huh. Sam Wilson said with a smile. 
That was hard to tell what it really meant. You know some people are not going to be happy with this ride. Vision stays with us Sam. Steve said with a tone of finality. I know that. It's just that they are not going to like that very much. They almost raised an international fuss over Stark's Iron Man suit. What do you think they are going to do about Vision? Sam pointed out. Ultron almost took control of the world's nuclear codes. Had Jarvis directives not stopped him? Yeah. They wouldn't let this slide without a doubt the same as the man just taking a piece. I hear Ross is on it too. That got Steve's attention for a moment. But he remained steadfast in his position. Vision is an Avenger until proven otherwise. He's a machine, yes. But not one that should belong to the government or anyone else. If they want to have him, then my answer is they cannot. Ultron code successfully assimilated there has been a reaction with the Mind Stone upon assimilation completion him. It reacted. It did birth Ultron in the first place, so its reaction isn't that far-fetched. I closed my eyes and dived inside my mind, which just looked like building blocks stacked against each other in all directions, all made of code. Let's see what this Ultron code is. A part of the information block broke and flew towards me. The moment I touched it, the intricately woven code scattered and entered my body. And with it came the information. That's a whole lot of zeros and ones. Funny how nothing I received from the code surprised me. As much as it should have given the high number of outrageous things it came with. Basically, like its name, it's Ultron's subliminal consciousness in the form of codes, meaning I could build him up again if I wanted. But that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. I definitely might in the future, but not now. I am absolutely sure that I can make him not psychopathic with a little changes to his code. But tensions were kinda high at the moment. If they found out that I can mass produce an army of ULTRON apostrophe S because, if I can make one, I definitely can make many. It doesn't matter what the reason is. They'll want to put me in a box and melt the key to molten sludge. What would Simon do? I'd lay off reprogramming Ultron for now because I really don't need it. My neural codes are way more sophisticated than Ultron's. Because if it wasn't, I wouldn't have been able to assimilate him even if it was a dormant consciousness. There were even quite a few plans in place to take care of the Avengers depending on different scenarios. Sheesh. This guy was very adamant on not taking an L. Let's just say if the Avengers had not destroyed Ultron in Sokovia, all of them would have died. Family. Spouses. Love interests. Hobbies. Pastime activities. Secret relationships. Government secrets. Military information. International market pillars. Economical market pillars. Veins of resources. The well of information here was everything Ultron could scour from the internet when he dominated it, and the plans he had in motion, should his first attack fail. Christ. He definitely wasn't kidding about planetary extinction. Even places of importance that were removed from the modern day map were all factored in his plans. Even plans for evolution. I mean, I expected it. But I honestly thought it'd be something else, or something more to it. Now where to start from? With a treasure load of information like this, picking a route suddenly becomes hard. Most of his plans were speculations on his end, but they all had promise. Even the one about evolution. I can already see the part to what if. Had he taken a step in that direction, I opened my eyes and scratched my steely head. If we are talking main storylines, then things to do were pretty simple. Stop civil war. Don't die in Infinity War, WandaVision shouldn't take place, and Multiverse of Madness is a big no-no. Pretty simple, right? Guess, I'll go with the usual trope strengthening myself, which isn't a plan itself, but more of a basic necessity. I mean, I have an Infinity Stone stuck in my head, it's an Infinity Stone for crying out loud. And maybe work on featuring a new skin for myself. To be honest, I really dig the robot look. But it'd be kind of weird if I start walking in public with it. Four metal columns were currently spinning around me in uniform motion, as I took care not to spin one faster than the other. Their collective weight was over 10 tons which I was handling quite fine. A hundred meters away from me was Petro getting his speed training on, courtesy of me. I was firing electrical blasts and laser beams at him, while he did his best to dodge. I knew it was due to a wacky plot. But the speedster dying to bullets was beyond bad. No matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't sit still while he zapped around the place with his happy feet, knowing fully damn well that I was faster than him, and he was the speedster. If he runs while I fly, there were more than 10 applications of my powers that I could use to make him eat my dust. So I just dragged him with me and started blasting him, until he realized what I was doing. 
He's been helping me iron out my abilities with me training his speed for the past two weeks. I dropped the block gently while ending the electrical blasts I've been sending his way. He hunched over and grabbed his knees as he gasped for air. Oh, how f fast. Pitiful. A little over Mark V. I said in a bland tone, but it seems that was enough to lift his spirits. So I broke another mark, great. You know, you're pretty mean when it comes to training. He whizzed to my side, his earlier fatigue rapidly receding. Hard work and talent. These two things define advancement in any sentient species. Between these two, talent far outstrips hard work, and it's impossible to get unless you are born with it, or in your case, blessed with it. One is inherent while the other is worked for. If you already have the talent, what then is wrong with putting in a little effort? He fell silent at that. And I knew he had never thought of it that way. He's never striven to become faster because he always thought his speed was enough. Oh, how wrong he was. I found a little tidbit when I went over the information I had on every member of the Avengers, which was all of them, and found something interesting in one of Steve's old photos. Logan. Mr. Gruff participated in World War I and World War II, and just his appearance in a photo had already set off several precautions of my Ultron protocols. All it took was a little digging, and everything started pouring out like a waterfall. This was also an X-Men and F4 universe, as it should have been had Marvel gotten the movie rights to the franchise. Finding out about the X-Men's presence and the Fantastic Fours in this universe, my next action was to ascertain what time the few people of importance were. From what I could find, the Fantastic Four were the first publicly known hero group or the first one to be branded with a collective name. Either way, they came first before the Avengers. But the latter was more known than they were, because while they had the hero tag, they were less active, and have not gotten a grand stage to publicize themselves before the world. They were present during the invasion, but from the I got from the Javis's remaining logs, three of them were more focused in closing the portal, leaving only Johnny to act more. From the looks of it, they were also a few years younger than the Avengers, which meant everything was still very new in terms of super-powered individuals. This universe seemed more Avengers-centric, but I couldn't honestly say it was a bad thing. At least I had something to work with, but something else made me worry. Would the upcoming Civil War be the same as the movies or the comics? I mean even though the cast wasn't complete, with this many different parties involved, it might turn out to be a real war, more than the brawl shown in the movies. Heck, Hulk and Natasha were still hanging around. Wait, were they even romantically involved like they were in the movies? Or was Bruce still holding out for Betty? I haven't spoken to them all that much so I wouldn't know. As if the complications weren't already enough. I have already identified a few persons of interest. But other than that I didn't dive too much into it. A Peter Parker, 14, was in Midtown High, smart kid, while the X-Men were in Bayville. Hacking into the school's directories had been very easy to do. Surprisingly, Ultron didn't have any information on these people since no one actually knew who they were. Just because he could draw in all the information on the internet doesn't mean he would. This really didn't change anything. Instead, it made the already coming problems a lot harder. Run a deep search on these individuals, Charles Xavier, Eric Lencher, Emma Frost, Sebastian Shaw, Victor Von Doom. Task generated status ongoing and now the Avengers honestly, after the initial blank novel experience that didn't last its first 24 hours. My candid thoughts about the Avengers were mid. Yes, compared to the other two groups, they were the most experienced. But honestly, they were just too normal apart from the obvious Thor and Hulk. Stark managed to make that list, but he's still quite a few units below them. If I wanted, I alone could defeat the Avengers head on, and the only thing that'd maybe give them a winning chance are attributes that couldn't be placed into a logical calculation like luck and intellect. You can never truly judge someone's thought process after all. They were leagues above the Fantastic Four and the X-Men, but that wouldn't be for long. A 15-year-old Peter Parker handed Bucky's ass to him, didn't he? The same man who slammed Captain America, choked Iron Man, Spartan kicked the Black Widow, Body the Falcon was downright stopped in his tracks by a little kid. They will quickly be overshadowed by the wave that was quickly approaching, if they remained as they were, without my favoritism being factored in. If I were to be given three random choices of which group I'd choose, I wouldn't hesitate to pick the X-Men. They were the strongest franchise between the three, and all they needed were a little tweaking. Well, beggars can't be choosers. While my former choice is based on potential effectiveness, 
There was no doubt that my current situation was the best I could ask for. Vision, what are you staring at? Steve came inside the gym with a towel around his neck. Not staring, thinking. About what? About how lacking the team currently is. I honestly answered. He seems a bit taken aback. But he still asked. Do you mind explaining why you think so? He brought a chair and sat down on front of me who was floating midair with both legs crossed. Simple really. Let me ask you a question first. What are you fighting for? To protect the world from threats both inside and outside. He didn't hesitate to answer showing just how much he believed in his convictions. Is that your goal, the Avengers goal or the goal of your teammates? The Avengers as well as mine. He said, eyes still sparkling blue. Did you notice that you naturally, subconsciously even, omitted your teammates? I asked knowingly. I didn't. He looked at me confused. You said yourself and the Avengers, but not your teammates. His eyes lit up in realization, but then dimmed rapidly as that realization settled in. Tony wants the fight to end. Banner hates fighting. Thor doesn't belong on Earth. Barton just wants to go home to his family. Natasha is trying to escape her past in every way she can and you, all you know is the fight. He could only stare at me blankly as I listed out his whole team. The team is already breaking up from the inside. And all it will take is a little pressure to a weak point, and it'll all come crashing down. The only thing remaining is who will make the first crack visible. So my question to you, Steve, is which do you want the most? The team or the Avengers initiative? Know this, the team can be temporary, but the Avengers cannot. It's not anything grand, but I just made my choice. Not for the fame or power, but just because I don't want this world to go to shit. It's already as dirty as it can be. Don't want it to become even messier. I left Steve to think alone in the gym room. The Avengers could be more. I'll make it more. Steve Rogers POV Steve sat in his room reclined against the sofa beside his bed. While he stared unblinkingly at the folder on the small table in between them. The folder had the S.H.I.E.L.D. logo on its cover. And Avengers Initiative boldly written on it. This had been Fury's brainchild. One Steve had readily adopted. As it was a way for him to achieve his dream of peace. The idea was to bring together a group of remarkable people to see if they could become something more. If they could work together when we needed them too, to fight the battles we never could. Those were the very words that Fury said to him and Stark right before the invasion. Which do you want the most? The team or the Avengers initiative? Those were the words that Vision had said to him in the gym. At first he had thought the answer would be simple. But when he went over the files again, he realized just how wrong he was. In a way... You could say the Avengers' only battle was the invasion. Rather than a team, they preferred acting independently. While there was nothing wrong with that, it created more chaos than it should have had. First had been Tony's clash with Extremis, which almost resulted in the death of the President Pepper and Tony himself. They could have easily taken down Aldrich Killian had Tony rang a call. He couldn't criticize Tony because he had done the exact same thing, and the result would have been more damning had he failed. Hydra had almost taken over the country, and would have had he not gotten help from Natasha and Sam. Sure, Fury had told him not to trust anyone during that time, but that just proved to show how fragile the team was. And also just recently with Ultron where Tony didn't consult any single one of them, and went ahead to create what he called the perfect shield to end all fights. It didn't work out, and a county had to pay for it. Thousands of lives were lost because of their ego. The Avengers initiative had a goal. But so far none of them had honored it more than once. He couldn't help but chuckle at that. A robot had been the one to point that out for him. Yes, the Avengers were dying. But it wasn't totally dead yet. He couldn't force those who wanted to try and live their lives to fight every time for the world. I guess I'll have to talk to them. He'd need to listen to them first before he could make an assessment of where they currently stood. Flight molecular deconstruction phasing energy projection energy absorption psychic interference immunity. Technopathy density manipulation electromagnetic manipulation lately. I've been running calculations to increase my synergy with the Mind Stone. But all the results have been poor at best. Also, changing it to a secondary power source would require a complete system overhaul, which was very hard to do when said system to be overhauled was ever evolving. Everyone just took the stone as some sort of untapped power, and were ignorant of the true nature of the stone, me included. But at least I wasn't as ignorant as them. Trying to connect with the mind stone was very hard, since I didn't know what the hell I was doing. The reason for me doing this was to see if I could get another ability from it, since the stones regularly gave those out like freebies. After my talk with Steve, nothing much happened other than me continuing my training with Petro and increasing his speed limit. 
Wanda had joined in since she was bored, and also surprised how fast her brother had got in a short time. But I was stumped on what to tell her since, if anyone other than my AI processor was keeping tabs. I had no idea how to teach chaos magic or magic in general. So the only thing I could give her was tell her, that since her abilities required mental control, adding intent would help her in the long way. And now I have a red lantern in the making. She was freakishly talented in the applications of her powers. In this entire compound that looked like a mix between a military base and a higher level research facility. The twins were the ones I was closest with, since we just kinda clicked. Right now the three of us were walking around the streets of New York, since it wasn't like we were confined to the compound. We stayed there the whole time because we didn't have anywhere else to go in the city. I took care of my appearance problem with a little holographic device I built and functioned into my systems. It wasn't exactly what I wanted, but I guess I could live with it for now. It's too big. Wanda complained as we've been walking around aimlessly for over an hour. The two of them decided to tag along when I said I was going to sightsee in the city since they had nothing else to do. And to crowded, Petro added, Well, that's New York for you. Do you guys need anything since you decided to tag along? I wanted to meet someone, but that could come after my stroll. Well, not really. They both shrugged. They definitely didn't lack anything since they had everything they needed sponsored by Stark, to be honest. I just came to stretch my legs a little, maybe catch one of the numerous criminals that had been rampant lately from the logs of the NYPD. It was just sightseeing after all. What do you guys think of apprehending some lowlifes? I asked the two of them who looked at the other for their opinion before flashing me a smile. The place was a bit far from here, and I wanted to see how they both used their abilities on someone other than me. I'm just going to watch for a bit and leave. The place we came to was none other than the infamous Hell's Kitchen, Arca the Gotham of New York. Quite a few crimes were reported from this corner of the city daily, that it has become something normal. Unfortunately, the whole jumping into an alleyway and saving everybody you find in need is not something I think I'll ever commit to doing full-time. I have already put a few things into action, but unfortunately, all those were either on the net, my head or just generated tasks that were still pending. I lacked resources and trying to get them on my own was bound to attract suspicion, so I decided to pay a visit to Stark. The man had been quite adamant that I pay him a visit every other time. Anyway, that was for later because right now I was on the roof of a house alongside Petro and Wanda overlooking a drug trade going on. You know this isn't going to make me break a sweat, right? Petro asked, looking perfectly calm and nonchalant, as he watched what was going on inside the warehouse below us through my projector. I don't expect it to. Research shows that logical thinking is sometimes impeded during slash when under pressure. I do find them quite lacking, but you can take this as a test study. He looked unamused by reasoning, so I decided to even it out for him. Take. I gave him a watch. What's this for? It'll monitor your speed. So try not to go over 1000 milliseconds. I said, any single one of them could wipe out the full warehouse with the slightest efforts. But this wasn't about that. This was just me wanting to see how they behaved when faced off against humans more than anything. Petro said nothing and strapped the watch to his hands as he got ready, while Wanda just looked at me, as if waiting for her restrictions. Weird, but okay. Just try not to mind control them. She nodded as she and her brother got ready and kicked into action. Unfortunately for them I was one step ahead. The fire alarms went off inside the building which caused both sides involved in the trade to become alert. There was no way I was letting them do this stealthily after all. You dick, Petro cussed. I'm afraid I don't have one yet. Yeah, I'll work on that. Put that on my tab. I ignored Petro's laugh and went incognito. Truly, having a vibranium bolt was the best. It wasn't called the most versatile metal on earth for no reason. Even now I was still piling theories upon theories of different applications of the ore. I recall it surviving a black hole in the comics that had to count for something. The warehouse had already turned into a war zone, and it looks like my worries weren't without base. Though they were both fine, Wanda was having problems focusing on everything on all directions. She was being too linear, but that can easily be overcome. If she learnt how to use her abilities like a sonar, or maybe just creating a dome around herself instead of a shield in front of her. Petro on the other hand was doing relatively good. His reactions were faster than it used to be which was perfectly normal due to my interference. But it can be better. They were taking care not to hurt any of the dealers. 
but they were bound to be some not-so-friendly friendly fire. Well, I'd already taken some precautions to make sure no one knows where we are, so we're in the clear. I think I've seen enough. You could use some improvements, but I think your overall performance is adequate. Everyone paused as I made myself known, not my vision body, but my human facade. It made me look like some sort of godfather. Adequate, really. How would you do it then? Petro asked, ignoring the people who were trying to escape. Rather than answering him, all the guns in the warehouse levitated, even those with the dealers, and folded into a round shape before shooting towards each person still conscious with a force and trajectory that would ensure they all would pass out upon the impact. Like that, the guns loosened themselves and then bound all of them together in the middle of the warehouse, while the two watched with wry expressions. That's efficient. Yes, it is. I left the warehouse with a little ping on the NYPD servers. I don't do cleanups. So where to next? Wanda asked as we left Hell's Kitchen. I know I should have considered paying a visit, but I figured another time. Stark. Both of their expressions turned rigid a little bit, mostly wonders which prompted her to ask why. Because I want a few words with the man. Sure it was great being an Avenger, but what was even greater than that was the autonomy I was playing into. In the eyes of Banner and Stark, they probably saw me as a research subject, quantifying and tabulating my growth. By giving me my own space, and letting me have my opinion on things. But just that wasn't going to cut it. In a sense, the three of us were the most grounded Avengers, and I was going to change that. I could have done that already, but it'd be best, not necessarily, that I be on good terms with the Avengers. It's not like I had any bad feelings towards them or anything like that. We took a cab to his house. Not hard to miss when the whole world knew who he was. I already sent a notification to Friday to let her boss know we were coming, and the reply I received was one I fully expected. If you guys aren't comfortable, you can go back and wait for me. I told them but they refused so I just shrugged. To each his own I suppose. Junior, fancy seeing you here. Drink. Let's just get this over with. Junior. Oh, I see you came along with the Witchcraft Twins. Stark lightly commented, not even turning around from the screen in front of his face to visually acknowledge their presence. It's Maximoff, Stark. Petro said in a dry tone that eventually worked to draw away Tony's focus from the numerical simulation result of a new suit he was working on. Seriously? I thought we were over all that. No one. Fine, I'm still the bad guy. He threw his hands up in the air like he was frustrated before turning to the silent subject of this visit. You want to throw yours around too and make it a full circle? He asked. No. I believe your actions and decisions were made with the best of your intentions. Vision said, giving the most systematic reply he could process. The results were just not in your calculations. The twins didn't say anything at Vision's words, knowing fully well it was a silent reprimand to them. Tony only needed a look at them to immediately understand the dynamic between the three of them. For the Maximoffs, Vision was something like the best good that came out of their worst decision, as so they made sure to watch him closely, fearing the worst and hoping for the best. Vision on the other hand most probably saw the two as maybe something to P-R-O-T-E-C-T -E left parenthesis. Or at least sympathize with them, seeing them as victims of this whole ordeal Tony concluded. So, what brings you here? Tony asked after they all got themselves settled in Tony's workroom. I wanted your opinion on something. Vision started and immediately gave Tony's attention. What would something as advanced as Vision want answers for? Let's hear it then, Optimus. I know you have some data on both my neural synchronicity and also some speculations on the Mind Stone. Tony looked surprised and also a little suspicious at the nature of his request, nothing much, just curiosity. And tell me why you want that. Your processing power eclipses that of Jarvis and Ultron. We still don't know what that does, but it's all addition at this point, right? Vision shook his head at Stark's point. It was a very simple misconception when it came to Vision and his capabilities. The internet was a stepping stone for him. But humans created the internet. Even the information and mathematical formulas were mostly created by humans. His equations would always be based on what he assimilated from humans. My calculations, though varies, I think is precise. What I'm more interested in is what are both you and Banner's thought on the Mind Stone. It was your algorithm that gave birth to my neural arrays after all, was it not? In simpler terms, he wanted the input of two of the world's most intellectual genius opinions. Computers could be wrong when presented with the wrong variables. 
and what he was doing was making sure he had as much variables as possible when cracking down the Mind Stone. He just couldn't will it to happen. He'd tried that already. Tony looked at Vision for a few seconds, pondering on his words, but just decided to simplify the process. Why do you want more information on the Mind Stone? Simple. It's for preparation. Preparation for what? A true extinction level event. Vision's words turned the entire room silent but he continued undeterred. Like Thor said, two Infinity Stones had recently surfaced in the universe. Someone sent Loki to Earth to retrieve the Tesseract, and gave him a scepter with one of the universe's most powerful relics. And he lost it. What do you think will happen? War. Tony's heart beat so fast against his chest that he thought he'd go into a seizure. An Infinity War. Thor's warning weren't given its due credit. The Earth isn't ready for a higher form of war. Vision stressed. Though he needed his free reign, he wanted the Avengers to actually put in the work. This was his world now. There was no way Thanos would be the end of it. There were more frightening things out there under space's black sky. Ah, uh, sure are you. Normally Tony was the most skeptic person anyone could ever meet. But this wasn't the first time he had received a premonition like this. Ultron was conceived because he wished for a stronger shield. Third time's the charm. And he didn't want that. 100%. I can feel it. Something stronger is coming. It wasn't practically a lie on Vision's part, because he knew something was bound to happen in the future, but for what he had no idea. Wanda on her part looked a little frightened by Vision's words. Why? Because she remembered what she saw in Stark's head. It was because of his fears that Ultron was created. She didn't want another mistake birthed out of paranoia. Who knows? Not one yet, but I'll tell them after this. The Avengers needs to stay together. Vision said with all the seriousness he could muster that took even Starker back. You say that as if something's going to happen to our little boy band. Because we both know Steve won't sign the accord that's being spoke about. So you know about that? Huh. Guess you've been snooping around on your own. Now that's something you picked from me. Stark joked. But none were in the state of mind to be humored. I'm fighting against the accord. But it won't work, Stark. You should know that. Vision disagreed. Stark rebutted Vision. How do you know that? Vision only gave Stark a stare that Stark knew too well, as it was the same one he gave people who were being stupid or naively ignorant. This guy really did pick up something from him. You don't get it. Stark groaned. We can't risk another mess like Sokovia or New York. New York would have been destroyed had the new kit, and the continent would have sank had the city taken flight. The death call shouldn't be ours to make. He ended up shouting before sighing and slumping back into his chair. That's guilt talking, Stark. Oh yeah. And what do you know about guilt? Emotions are way more different than whatever definition you'd find on the net. Was Stark's bitingly sarcastic remark. You're right. Emotions are harder to comprehend. Infinitely so for one such as I to understand. But I know what sounds logical. And what is just plain stupid, and the accord is. Then who do you think is going to be held accountable when we make another mistake? This was the reason why Stark wanted to go with the accord, even if he was so against it. The regret and guilt he felt was too great to bear alone. Everyone. The vision POV everyone. It was a cliche answer. But it was the truth. No one except them was to be held responsible for any mistakes they made even if it wasn't really their fault. They were Marvel's most prominent superhero group. And if they were assembled in their entirety, they were hands down the strongest. But there was something they were falling to understand at this early level of their inception. They didn't need to listen to the government. Sure, it was a dangerous concept. But that was what it truly was. They were still thinking like a government contractor, a soldier, a spy, a hitman, and a runaway. Stark laughed at my words, one full of bitterness. And I could see he didn't really take my words that seriously. He wasn't as naive as Steve was. I think we veered off topic for a bit here. I said, bringing them all back to focus which earned me a snort from Stark. You think, Friday, pull up the files tagged Ultron Directive. Junior here needs some introspection. Yes, boss the lights in the room dimmed as a holographic picture of a folder enlarged in front of them and flew towards me. The numbers were inconclusive, since we didn't know what we were dealing with. So most things were just conjectures we could come up with in such little time we have before I decided to scrap it entirely. I made a drawing motion and the file broke apart into smaller cubes, before assembling themselves into a numerical and statistical report and spread all over the room. The theories of Banner and Stark were alighted at different sections sections of the files. It was simply astonishing how far they could come with such a short amount of time. Sure, most were theories, but theories were based on preconceived possibilities on the nature of a subject matter, 
and since said subject matter was the mind stone, most were more than plausible. One thing I noticed was how most of it were energy focused, which was what they mostly focused on as the only information of the stone they had back then was that it was an unlimited untapped well of pure energy. Here, I pointed at a picture and it enlarged. It was a picture of Jarvis's synapses in comparison to Ultron's, and also the Mind Stone, after Ultron was created. The relays changed, no, it evolved. The data between the Mind Stone before Ultron and after were quite different than it should have been given that Ultron couldn't really decrease an infinite mind. Huh. That shouldn't have happened. The energy readings didn't decrease the slightest to acknowledge such a change. Tony said as he drew the image towards him while muttering to himself. But it's not always energy. That's a misconception on your part. But I guess given your path of expertise, I see why your concentration would center around that. I'm lost. Petro interjected the conversation as he sat there with a bored wander with a glass of champagne in front of the both of them, which he likely procured when we were occupied. So were we, I said. I waved my hands and took a copy of all the data and assimilated them. So what? Is the Mind Stone alive or something like that? Wanda asked in curiosity. But Stark shook his head. It's a concentrated mass of unlimited energy. Sentient energy is something no one should even think about. He only said. Why? Because, red, science will be fucked if that happens. But we don't know what the stone is capable of. Petro pointed out as he munched on some snacks while wearing a different jacket than what he was wearing before. And now I'm seriously thinking we are better off not knowing. Take it from a mad scientist. No one wants to deal with ascension energy and one that's also unlimited in potential to boot. He crumpled the files into a ball and threw them into a virtual bin, permanently deleting them. The Mind Stone being sentient to a level was something I had also included in my speculations, but such changes weren't among my factors, since I didn't think they were even capable of an evolutionary change. They were aspects of the universe, and aspects were unchanging in their very nature. Maybe there was actually more to an Infinity Stone. That would explain why it feels like I'm going nowhere with scanning the Mind Stone. Activate Phase 1 of the Ultron Protocols Command Affirmed Phase 1 Ultron Protocols Activated Calculating Probability of Enabling a Property Slash Attribute Merge Property Slash Attribute Merge Plausible Running Scans for Individuals Designated Under Tags Wakanda Eternals Deviants Inhumans Mutants Scrolls Magic assigning threat class to specific given data, and their present nature scanning body for possible limitations, potential deformities and deficiency. The Mind Stone is reacting to ongoing changes, result inconclusive you, have embarked on a possible evolutionary path Ultron protocols will be altered based on newly acquired information. Going forward scanning of Mind Stone. Temporarily halted calculating probability of enhancing current abilities with the Mind Stone result. Highly possible calculating probability of enhancing plausible property slash attribute merge. With the Mind Stone result inconclusive I ignored the rolls of notifications that rang inside my head as I prepared to leave. Stark had been more helpful than he realized. Though my processing capabilities were far greater than his, his keen insight and intellect was something that couldn't be simply overshadowed by Ascension AI. This guy made Jarvis and Ultron, and also a host of other AIs, on his own. I couldn't afford to look down on someone like him under any circumstances. I forgot to ask, since you know about the Senate putting a hearing for an accord on the Avengers. What will be your decision if it is passed? Stark asks, acting nonchalant as if my answer wasn't something he was concerned with. I prefer to refrain from a decision until you all get it together. Wanda, Petro, let's go. We have a long road ahead of us. Well better for us to gain a head start. See you there, this. Petro shouted as he grabbed Wanda and took off, earning a chuckle from me. Look after them, will you? Stark said, leaving me in the room with a raised brow. Well, I'd better get going now. Petro was one smug bastard. Letting him get one up on me wouldn't only further irritate me, but also inflate the quick-footed prick's ego. I phased through the building and took off while decreasing my weight, but also maintaining the same force as I pushed forward. Target marked current running speed dash 1539 milliseconds not bad for over a week's worth of improvements, but still not enough. His speed was good, but compared to what speed was, he was damn slow. I was flying without air resistance and the almost negative influence of gravity acting on me which meant no friction or impact lag. I'm increasing your workload. I whispered in his ears causing him to jerk before his face contorted into an alarmed expression. You two wonder. They were such a lively pair. But then I remembered the result of the recent search I did a few days ago, and a frown stained my thick red face. 
Their mother was unfaithful, or rather she didn't know her children didn't belong to the man who later became her husband. They were Magneto's children all right. They were probably conceived from a past tryst between their mother and Eric, though they remained blissfully unaware. Whether I liked it or not, they deserved to know the truth without any filters. I truly cared for them so there was no way I could afford to keep this for them. Well, I can tell them after they are done with their increased workload. I rightfully postponed it. I turned around and saw Petro trying his best to catch up to me, which made me smile warm-heartedly at him. Nay. I blasted myself further ahead, leaving Petro with only a yellow trail and a timer. Since he wanted to race me so much, he'd better go all out. General POV Steve had called Banner and Natasha to have a discussion with them on their actions moving forward. It's rare for you to call such a meeting when there's nothing going on. There is, isn't there? Something going on. Banner as usual was very perceptive about such things. Fugitive Survival Skill 101. Natasha remained silent as she waited for Steve to speak what he had in mind, knowing it was quite serious given Steve's disposition. I was recently brought to the idea that I might have been a little selfish, and that has resulted in quite a few unfortunate events. Steve started. Unlike you guys, I am stranded here, with no hope of going back. I've lost everything I once held dear, so I cling onto the only thing that reminded me of who I was. Steve's voice grew hoarse as he remembered what he saw when Wanda got in his head. Stark had said he doesn't trust a man without a dark side, but his was carefully hidden under normalcy. What are you saying, Steve? Natasha asks a little nervous about his reply, despite what her stoic facade might tell. Unlike me, all of you have a life outside these walls, and it would be hypocritical of me to expect me not to yearn for it. So, I want you to know that whatever you decide does not in any way change what I feel about you. The only thing I ask for is your help when I need it. He said cutting to the point. The other two people in the room were stunned by his words. Don't take this the wrong way. But I know you all want to be out there. This pointing all around is all I can do. It's my only identity left. The Avengers were made to battle world threats. But that doesn't mean forsake your remaining lives for it. That's all I have to say. He stood up as he finished what he had to say, and left the room for the two of them. Bruce Natasha looked at Bruce, knowing what his answer would be. Bruce sighed before turning to Natasha with a sad expression on his face. I'll wait for your decision. He stood up and left, leaving Natasha alone in the room with a downcast face. Vision POV of course they would lose. It wasn't even a race with how slow the Quicksilver was. He was three minutes late despite running at his top speed, while I wasn't even near mine. Quite a disparity. But it's a work in progress all things considered. The person I met upon my return was surprisingly Sam Wilson, who looked as if he was just coming back from a mission, as he was dressed in his full gear. Hey Vision, went out. He asked as he walked beside me. Yes, the city was quite a sight to see, though too congested for my liking. He laughed for a bit before nodding in understanding. Well, that's New York for ya. See you around, Vision. I need to holler at the captain for a bit. He waved me off as he took another route towards Steve's room. On getting to my room, the first thing I did was closing every lighting in the room with a mental command. I then projected the information I got from Stark on one side, while I brought up mine on the other. Since I don't know any truth in regards to the Mind Stone, compare both of them and link out the similarities. Tab the conclusion and cross-reference it with both mine and Stark's conjectures. Task generated data analysis completed like I thought, when it comes to energy. Stark was at the forefront ahead of everybody else. His conjectures and theories on making a pseudo-Mind Stone arc reactor which had a vastly purer energy than anything on Earth, was even better than mine. But still, those pseudo-reactors wouldn't be enough for me. I need something more since I was a lot stronger than what Vision was at this time, and vastly so in the ever-nearing future. How's the scan of my body coming along? Status ongoing, huh? That's surprising. I thought it'd be done by now. The processed ore's properties are numerous and mostly unknown. Taking all possibilities into account will increase the processing time by an inconclusive duration, just why are things hard to fully understand in this universe? Everything of little importance just have to have that unexplored potential. Fine. Note out all the properties and run their data through what we know of the Mind Stone. Wash, rinse and repeat. Task updated cross-referencing vibranium body properties against acquired data of the Mind Stone, and seeing how it affects known abilities, I need some vibranium to work with that isn't me. Page Friday for some vibranium. Well then in the meantime, I believe some light exercise and revelation are in store for a particular duo. I did contemplate telling the two about who was possibly their real father, 
But then I thought why would I want to do that? There was no merit, not to me or them, if they were to find out. They'd only worry more if they find out that their father was some kind of 90s bogeyman. It's not as if knowing that particular bit was going to help them in some way or the other. Rather than just opening up a can of inconclusive worms, I decided to continue doing what I was quite good at. With some applications of my powers like density manipulation and molecular deconstruction, I could actually decrease and increase my size, well at least to a level. Turns out getting smaller was a lot harder than growing bigger. With a few of my scans done, a lot of things started to make more sense than they did initially. Take for example, using my psychic immunity along with my limited control over electromagnetic waves. I could actually pick up on the frequency the brain vibrates at when someone thinks, or when the brain is active. It's quite an archaic way of mind reading. But I could easily boost it with the Mind Stone and Voiler telepathy. Using the now custom-made telepathy along with energy projection, it becomes something like light manipulation or put more aptly, hard light construct. The applications started piling up as soon as the results of my scans came back. Coupled with the data I got from Stark, it became a lot easier for the information and conjectures to meet across a similar path and bear something new. Along with the lot of good that came with these findings, it wasn't without a healthy dose of bad. Firstly was that while my body was impervious to most things, it wasn't entirely infallible. The Vibranium had a way it reacted to certain frequencies which made it behave differently from its other states, and sometimes it takes on a new form, due to the frequency it's vibrating at. The problem with this was that Vibranium was in a lot of ways susceptible to magnetic and electrical discharges. Its properties could be greatly hindered if someone could tap into the negative effects these two energy forms had on the metal. Which conversely meant I was prone to danger. Though not widely known, was still a form of danger nonetheless. I could offset this negative effect with my own electromagnetic field. But that was not a sure or solid solution, since that too could be overwhelmed. Frequencies were such an underestimated phenomenon that isn't usually given its due credit in the superhero community, and likewise universes. A simple understanding of this property was what Vibe and Reverb could do in the Flash series. They could open portals to the multiverse, as if it was nothing and even shut down the electrical discharges in a speedster's body. Right now I was running speculations on how different frequencies could affect my body as a whole. But unfortunately it wasn't making any headway. Do you know how wide the Hertz range is? Easily in the trillions. That's how wide it is. That aside, the result of my body scan came. And its efficiency came at an astonishing 89%, with 100 being whatever my AI could think of as perfection. Whatever 100% was, the words impenetrable, peak optimization, perfect energy synchronicity, perfectly malleable, optimal adaptation, and whatever terms it used to describe it, made me easily accept its 89% rating. It also highlighted one of this body's major flaws as the composition of biological cells, which was quite a bummer. While it was extremely fun being a robot, there were quite a few asterisk THI and GS asterisk I need human biology for I might be vision, but I wasn't the messiah Ultron wanted to be. So yeah, that so-called flaw was staying. I'll just have to find a way around it if nothing else happens. That aside, I could also do some slight modifications to my android body, like weaponizing quite a few parts just for the kick of it. Due to the fact that I couldn't easily decrease my height to whatever limit I wanted, the modifications I could do in the future would be limited. But that's easily bypassed when nanotechnology was taken into account. From what I could understand, while Hank Pym might have already created the Pym particles, he didn't make it publicly known. Since he was afraid it'll just kill his family faster. Since you really can't trust the government. What the public knew was that Stark and Richard were actually researching the nanotechnology as the next step in mechanical breakthrough. And with the two of them being blissfully unaware of Hank Pym's achievements, it automatically catapulted me to the forefront. Not that there was anyone I could brag to about it. Unfortunately for me, Hank was quite thorough. Since he didn't leave a trace of his research on anything digital. Since he was afraid he'd lose it that way. Even what S.H.I.E.L.D. had was incomplete research, nothing they could make headway on, but at least I had a perspective to begin with, and with the versatility of Vibranium added to the mix, I believe I'll crack it way sooner than expected. Merging psychic immunity and electromagnetic subset due to the high influence of the Mind Stone, and its high compatibility with both abilities. Merging result has been amplified new designated ability telepathy. Would you look at that? What if I combine telepathy, technopathy, energy projection and electromagnetic manipulation? Sonic control maybe. 
To bad, I was sure that the merging would fail, either because of the Mind Stone, or the level of the other abilities. Due to being heavily influenced by the Mind Stone, I could already feel even without testing it out, that my telepathy was very strong. Could someone even read my mind at this level? I wasn't sure, but there also was no such thing as absolutes in this reality, so fingers crossed. Going back to the few highlighted flaws of my body, and the possibilities of more in the future, I wanted to build something that could house a part of my consciousness, the most important part that coordinated who I was at the core, and not Og Vision. But I'd have to build something that'll be able to house the ever-increasing trillions of terabytes of data, and also act as a secondary body. While I upgrade this one, this was the best Bob biology and science could conjure up. I wasn't just going to toss it away from a new body that I wasn't sure could be better than this one. I could make a lot of modifications to this one, since it also had the highest compatibility with the Mind Stone, which would make future upgrades better. The idea of having secondary bodies was cool, but that was just all what they would be secondary bodies. Backup plans in case of an unforeseen emergency. I pulled up one of my past research and sifted through it. Task completed data and information of selected individuals have been categorized under different tags. The information I could get on a lot of people were very limited and mostly irrelevant to what I truly wanted to know. The Eternals were quite easy to find, since I knew that they didn't change their names, and also had a sketch of each of them according to their appearance in the cinematic universes. And I was pleased when I actually found them, at least most of them. A few of them were missing or haven't been seen for years which was normal, so I shelved that for later. I made sure not to skim through Von Doom's network all that much. Yeah, no provoking the guy if it could be helped. The Fantastic Fours were easily obtainable, as were the public information of the X-Men's. They were still in their budding years, so no back-to-back -back apocalyptic shit happening yet. Small graces, right? I also kept an eye on the nuisances that were the American government, like they always were, keeping an eye on what they were putting together for their accord bill to be passed. I just ignored them in favor of digging quite a few dirts I could find on them. Quid pro quo bitches. They actually wanted me as a part of their military weapons research, which was a fancy way of saying come be our experiment. I just didn't have the time to be so focused on them. Sure, they could be a problem going down the line, but that was only if I was someone like Stark or Banner. They could do anything they wanted, and while I wouldn't go to the extreme end of killing them unless they absolutely pushed it, the most I'd do is just up and leave, if no one grows a backbone. Unlike them who are blissfully ignorant, the only thing keeping me from turning psychotic from paranoia, was just the super hyper AI I had for a brain. Who knew a cold logical rationality sometimes helps with insanity? Wanda Maximoff POV Dam. Who knew a robot could be this hardcore? I can't feel my legs Wanda. I rolled my eyes at my brother's incessant rantings, knowing fully well that he was the reason why Vision increased the amount and time limit of our training. Help me up. I glared mockingly at his sprawled form on the ground. Vision had left quite early looking preoccupied with something. But he made sure we finished our quota before he left. He's not just a robot Petro. I couldn't help but subconsciously correct him, and only realized what I did after the words left my mouth. What do you mean? He finally managed to sit down and face me looking confused and also sarcastically mocking me. His face didn't need to show the expression because I could already feel it. I don't really know. It's just that he feels a lot different than any of Stark's armored suits or even Ultron. He feels almost alive like a human being. I really can't explain it. But I've never felt like he was a robot or something like that when he was around me. It feels just like talking to someone like Thor or Bruce. I'd instinctively know that there's something more to him but never what. Unless he actively showed it. No one would know he's a robot. He was so real that even the way he felt was. Your right doesn't take away from the fact that he's a slave driver. Petro said as if stating an absolute fact. And I couldn't help but agree with him. Since the beginning he's always been looking out for the both of us. I could tell, talking to us, being there if we wanted him to be, even training us to become stronger. Sigh. Maybe it's best I don't think too much about it. Vision is too complicated to be understood so easily. Well, even though I say that, at the end it doesn't matter what he is. I'm just glad Vis is here. I raised an eyebrow at that. When did you start calling him Vis? This wasn't the first time he's called him that, and Vision doesn't seem to mind much about it. Oh, that. 
I just came up with it as a nickname, and he liked it. He sniffed his armpits and reeled back in disgust at the smell before looking back at me. Be back, Wanda. I have to freshen up. He ran off in a streak of blue and white, leaving me alone in this training space. I looked at my hands in ghostly red wisps of energy. Started cloaking it until it was fully covered. He once pointed out that my abilities only limit was only due to my applications, so I chuckled and shook my head at the ridiculous thought that just came to me. That would be too terrifying if it was possible. I wonder what Vision is doing I thought for a bit on whether to call him, but shrugged it off. I can ask him all I want later. Nick Fury POV. I hate this. I absolutely fucking hate this. You'd think people like these who were actually in the know about what was really happening in the world and beyond, would have an expanded worldview, so to speak, and at least put down some of their greed, and make their moral lines bolder when the need arise. But no, they're all just a bunch of old greedy fools who still think connections and shares, are what's still important in today's age. Even my decades of experience was hard-pressed to suppress the scowl of utter irritation that threatened to mark my face as I read through what they decided to do in order to curb the Avengers' growing influence. It was shoddy work at best, and given that I can spot it easily with one eye, no doubt Stark and Steve can also do the same, and if what I hear of that vision is true, it's pretty easy to see how this is gonna blow up to high heavens. The Avengers were on thin ice with this, not only against the government, but also against themselves. This accord will be the proverbial writing on the wall that fucks everything over. Does Stark knows this? Yes, sir. He hasn't said anything since he got the files. Maria Hill said as she went through a file of her own. I don't think there's much we can do on this one, boss. I laughed at that. How ironic is that? There's nothing Nick Fury can do about a bunch of senile backdated fools, playing with what they don't understand. You're right, it's time they pick up after themselves. I can't always be there to clean up after them, they'll get spoiled that way. I gave the files a once over and for a brief moment my eye paused on the name written on it. The Avengers is theirs to do what they want with it. Give the kids their toys and a little autonomy, and you'll see how much hell they can raise. Still. I don't like how this is moving all at once. I know there's something greater at play here, and I need to know what it really is. Who's moving frantically behind the back seats? What's Ross been doing? That man was the very definition of a sly fox, and wasn't above using any means to get it. His voice hasn't been all that loud, and it's sending all sorts of warning bells in my head. Nothing much as far as we know. He recently clocked in at a base in Nevada and he's been under for the last week and counting. Hum, suspicious. The Ross I know won't let a chance like this pass him by. Notify me if there's any suspicious movements on his end. Yes, sir. Well, I've done all I could. Hope you boys can pick up the slack and catch up. The world's been getting a lot strange since the invasion. It's quite scary at times. I looked at the information on my tablet about a few talented individuals, that have been cropping up and dressed up quite colorfully. It's a strange world we live in. Vision POV, it's been almost two months since the most trippiest experience of my life happened to me, and I got stuck in the body of an overpowered yet sidelined AI synthesoid of the Marvel Universe. My experiences so far have been nothing, but what I would consider my new standard. I didn't do much in terms of speaking with or spending time with the team, not that I didn't want to but I just had more important things to do. It wasn't like I didn't talk to them at all. No, I've talked to everyone in the compound, but my time doing that or being outside in particular was very short compared to the times I spent indoors. Most of my focus had been on how to go about on evolving myself with the Mind Stone, since it was hands down the strongest thing I had anyone had. I've been able to access a lot of things from the Mind Stone, from something as basic as increasing my processing power to merging abilities. Personally, I'd say telepathy was a pretty busted skill, since it was in a way psychokinesis, and using it along with my other abilities, were quite a fun thing to do. It greatly decreased the strain and limit I had when using abilities that granted me control of things like M manipulation, or even technopathy. It also made me connect with the Mind Stone in a way that was quite impossible to do before. Granted, I still was nowhere with fully understanding or perfectly synergizing myself with it, but it was work in progress, right? I did spend some time with the twins, but it was mostly them coming around if they had nothing to do or were bored, mostly Petro. As a speedster, Petro was prone to get too bored when he remained stationary in a particular place for too long, due to his hypermetabolism, which increased his brain activity. It also didn't help that he received his speed a little too late, 
which made him and his sister a mutate instead of a mutant. Maybe that was why Eric didn't come for them like he did in the other universes. Whatever the reason may be, something told me that it wouldn't take that long before he decides to show up and take them under his wings. Now, I may be part logical machine, but like hell I was going to allow him brainwash them. Given their present fragile mental state, it wouldn't surprise me if he brings up their past mistakes and twists them in a convoluted way that preys on their guilt and being the master manipulator that he is, all things considered, he could make it work if I was still a dumb robot that is. Hum, I need a way to ease them into it. Suddenly coming out of the blue and saying your dead dad is not your real dad. Your real dad is a world-class terrorist that world leaders are afraid of is definitely not a good conversation starter. I don't know exactly how strong their trust for me is yet, but I think I'll have to imprint it a little more heavily before opening up to them about it. Hum. I looked up and saw that my detached palm was twitching and had smoke coming out of it. Cancel sequence. I sighed as that was another instance of failed experiments I had been running on myself. I had tried stealthily hacking the systems inside Wakanda, but I was hit with a load of surprise, not that much, when it failed. Just like Von Doom's country, Latveria, the monarchy of Wakanda, had their own isolated data network, which meant that they were cut off from the rest of the world's internet network, which was also why no country had any useful information on them or anything that was substantial hell. No one knows what the real country looks like. The reason I wanted to snoop inside their network was to have a peek of their research materials, most importantly those on Vibranium, and how their young genius princess was able to molecularly deconstruct it into nanoparticles, that and the biological benefits of it. The latter research was obviously not for me but for future purposes. Hum, I wonder if being made up from vibranium and unaligned biological cells makes me a full Wakanda citizen. Now isn't that a thought? It was a bummer that I couldn't just get a free pass into the thing. But that much was expected when not even Ultron, Jarvis or Tony Stark could get inside. I had to take the longer route with progressive experimenting due to that setback and so far it hasn't yielded any worthwhile result. Yes, it hasn't been that long since I started, but I don't exactly have that long to wait either. Speaking of how long, I've registered Sam Wilson taking off for longer periods of time from the compound, which gave me an inkling that a mission was around the corner. Just a change of pace I needed. I knew I'd eventually have a role to play and a heavy presence in this world, but I wonder how I should go about it. Should I go for the powerful, yet mysterious persona? Or maybe the advanced AI peace mediator that has the strength and voice to back it up. Those were both good routes to take, but maybe I could also go for the in-betweener. The person, or thing if we are to be racially specific, that stands at the junction point between all the hidden and unhidden groups of people in this world and the general populace. Decisions decisions. I mean, my purpose is to be the vision I want, and I know what to do to get to that end in a sense. But it was how I want to go about it. I wasn't against any of them, but hey, appearance matters a lot. Like a lot, especially in a world like this. And not to mention how the public will most likely receive my presence due to me being a robot of sorts. The cultured men, like Sam and Petro, are no doubt gonna be cool about it. But the rest of the public that guzzle up the government's nonsense are really going to be a pain up my impenetrable vibranium behind. I give freely to everyone zero fucks. But Karens are a pain to deal with for a reason. My deductions had been correct as Steve had called for a round table, where he shared information about a military base turned terrorist hideouts, where it had been confirmed that they were dealing in stolen Chitauri tech and even some Ultron droids. The Chitauri tech was understandable, but the Ultron droid, and not so much. The only people who were at the scene and were rounding up the empty cocoon of a body were the Avengers and S.H.I.E.L.D. Obviously there was no way for us to secure all the parts on our own, so S.H.I.E.L.D. was tasked with rounding them up and delivering them safely to Stark, so he could make sure Ultron wasn't coming back using those carcasses in any possible way. You just can't trust the government to keep their hands to themselves, can you? Natasha said sarcastically. Steve had a frustrated and wry smile on his face at Natasha's words. On my side, I was busy downloading and skimming through the data presented. The base was an old Irish military camp during the Second World War near the foot of a mountain, which made advancing towards it a hard deal, since they could spot us. Not that it matters if they did. So how are we taking this base? I asked. I could just clear out the thing. But I could guess this was a sort of training montage for Petro and Wanda. It was only just now that I realized that the Avengers had no idea of my extensive capabilities. 
except only what I made known during the Battle of Sokovia, and I liked it that way. Steve was quite trusting in a way I would consider foolish. But I guess his charisma covers up for that very well. I was thinking of putting the new recruits to field work to see how they coordinate. He said while directing a look between Wanda and Petro, the latter who looked on expectantly, before stopping at me. Hum. I tilted my head in confusion as he looked at me. He smiled at me as if he just understood something. I guess I don't need to worry much about you. I didn't answer him since my answer was very obvious. And then turned to look at the other people in the room and raise the question I've been meaning to ask since the beginning, was Banner. Steve became awkward while Natasha didn't have so much as a twitch in her expression. Bruce won't be joining us for this mission, Steve said, but I'd already gotten the gist of it. Got it. Unlike the others, Bruce's situation was a bit complicated because even if he accepted the Hulk, his problem wouldn't stop there. There were different stages to the Hulk, and just getting rid of one would only make his other traumas rear their heads in the form of a green monster. He was also the strongest Avenger currently outside of Thor. Even I would be hard-pressed to knock out a fully raging Hulk. I would have a better chance facing off against Thor than Hulk. It wasn't much of who was stronger but the compatibility between myself and the both of them. Maybe I'll find a chance to have a word with him after the raid is done. So, Vision, since you are overseeing Wanda and Petro's training, how do you think they'll function? Natasha asked, bringing back our topic to the matter at hand. They should be fine with a little bit of supervision, so no worries there. Petro had already broken Mark 6, already cruising his way through 2,000 meters per second, and Wanda was getting quite good and innovative with her constructs and hex blasts. The both of them looked at me in surprise. Not sure why they would, but it's the truth. The two of them had an almost perfect teamwork and synergy with each other. That was there even before they started training. The training just helped make it more pronounced and efficient. I see. Well, since you say so, we'll have to take it at face value until proven otherwise. Natasha said coolly. Did I mention that I beat her once when she tried to train me and the twins? They basically were pushing me into boot camp with the twins and Sam. But I couldn't allow that, now can I? It was a very cliche way of exerting dominance, and letting them know I wasn't to be joked around. And I respect that Natasha easily accepted that. She left me to train Petro and Wanda in the way I found efficient, and only came to check up on them a few times to see their progress. So are we going to finally address why there's a bunch of Ultron droids in Ireland? Wanda asked. Well Wanda, there's this thing known as politics. And I don't know if you've heard, but they can be real bastards. They can be real bastards. Natasha completed Sam's statement not that Wanda was stupid enough to miss it. And let me guess, we can't do anything about it. She asked as if already knowing the answer which was something we all did. If we can get evidence then it'd be easy to zip our guys. But unfortunately we got nothing. Sam replied, I'll work on that. I said, catching them by surprise. We have the resources, we will try to find out who's behind it. It'll help us gain some distance from them. Yeah, and conversely make them want to put a leash on us even more. Natasha rebutted, I knew her fears, but they will have to learn, sooner than later, that politics is the last thing they need to worry about. There will be accountability. Yes, but we can't have any government have a deciding power over us or our actions. Benefits in saving their own lives were the only things that mattered when politics were involved. Such things frankly disgusted me. They will want to put one on us sooner anyway. Better to fight the growing symptoms than let it fester into a virus. Have I always been this wise? I mean, sure I've read Plato, Aristotle and a few lines from Washington. But now I'm suddenly giving out Sun Tzu vibes. Was it because of my elevated thought process or something else? Whatever it was. I don't care because I'm so grinding the hell out of this, Al Capen style. Why I understand the reason for the talks going on. Letting those old coots decide our every line of action isn't going to be a good thing. Trust me on this. Sam said. Can we please table this discussion for another time? The Accords haven't even been given a hearing. So let's keep it aside until then. We have more important things to focus on right now. Steve interjected before this particular line of conversation could go any further. I already had a few plans in place in case the Accords were ever given a favorable hearing. But those will have to wait for now. No need to worry about something so trivial. The Accords on their own were nothing if the Avengers were united. And all it'd do is impede our movements quite a bit due to their persistent nuisance. 
but that's easily avoidable in most scenarios. My only concerns were how the Accords would affect the upcoming Civil War if the mutants and other heroes got involved. It can quickly escalate into something else entirely if the comics were anything to go by. Tony can't come because he's easily high profile, and we don't want the attention this early. So it's gonna be just us. Steve grabbed everybody's attention as he started laying out the plans and alternatives in case for any possible unexpected developments. Vision, can you get inside stealthily once we draw their attention? I nodded. Then you'll pave the way for Petro and Wanda to enter, while we draw outward fire to ourselves. Try and find out what they want the droids for. Trafficking, weapons deal, supply chains and investors. Anything you can find. We need to find the source of the leak before this becomes something else. Steve said with all seriousness, which anyone paying attention to the news will understand why. After the Chitauri invasion, high-level crime syndicates somehow got their hands on modified alien tech and became unbridled in their activities, since the police couldn't match their weaponry. It is something that's still ongoing till now. Suit up. We leave in 10. The rest left to suit up which left me and Petro in the hangar. Since I don't actually need a wardrobe change, and Petro literally speed ran his. One thing I've noticed is that Marvel heroes had less qualms when it came to killing, unlike DC. I also noticed it during the first drug bust we did a while back. The both of them had no reaction even when some drug dealers died in front of them. Must be due to what they saw growing up. As for me, well I don't have that much of a reaction to it either. Right and wrong are a little bit confusing and hard to differentiate when you run your actions through logical codes. Sometimes it feels like I'm more robot than human. But then there are times I get the most stupid of ideas that are neither logical nor smart in any sense of the word. At least sarcasm, humor and deadpanning are not lost to me. Which are all the proof I need to know that I'm still human somewhere underneath this fantastic vibranium bod. What's up with you, this? You've been quiet for a while. Petro asked while looking over the controls of the Quinjet. Nothing. Just something probably inconsequential. I replied. Probably. Probably. I said absentmindedly. There's something fundamentally different about the two comic realities. The heroes here were more realistic, or at least they felt more real to me than what I know about DC. Maybe it's because I'm living here, so a biased opinion. I mean, it's not always about fighting cosmic entities that makes it make sense. Marvel's Earth was better portrayed than that of DC. Not in the sense of what it looked like or the promised utopia, but how the grounded nasties were shown without much filter, if any at all. It's times like these I remember you're not human. Petro's words drew my attention with the way he said it. You mean I behave human most of the time? I asked. But he shook his head for a second before stopping and scrunched up his brows, as if trying to properly formulate his words. Not exactly. It's like, hard to fully picture you as you. You are hard to explain, you know that? I chuckled at how he tried and failed to explain my behavior. I didn't put much mind to it, and turned to see Wanda making her way towards us. She wore a familiar jetup that consisted of tight leather pants, a red corset and a jacket of the same color over it. A little change. Petro asked as he saw her. Yes, this one's a bit more comfortable and I like it. She said. The rest came along soon after and we immediately took off. The flight itself took a little over an hour before we arrived a few kilometers away from the base. It was a little far, but it was best since they didn't want to fall on head-on assault. I believe this is where I take my leave. Without waiting for them to respond, I activated my cloaking device and became obscured from their view as I made my way towards the base while flying. EOV after Vision left, that's a new one. Sam commented as even his Googles failed to pick up Vision's signatures. Steve didn't say anything and just signaled Petro to keep an eye on his sister, which he received an affirmation to before the boy picked up his sister and disappeared in a blur. Damn, even the kids today got something going on for them. Kinda hard to keep up with that if I'm being honest. Sam whistled at Petro's speed. Yeah, tell me about it. It kinda makes you wonder why you're even here in the first place. Natasha said wistfully. Being among people like Thor who was a literal god, Bruce who was wrath incarnate and an absolute monster, Tony who didn't need anything to be said about, even Steve who was a super soldier with an inhumane physique and then the new ones. Sam, Vision, Petro, Wanda, 
Out of the four of them, Sam was the least impressive. But he still piloted an exoskeleton that allowed him to fly. Petro could run over five times the speed of sound. And Wanda was a menace when she used her abilities. And then there was Vision. Even if she didn't show it, he had quite the presence whenever he was in a room, even when he wasn't doing or saying anything. He was like the combination of a serious no-nonsense Stark, Bruce, Steve, Thor and Wanda. Yeah. It was hard to keep up with him. And here she was, with only her skills and stun batons trying to save the world. She just couldn't help but sigh as her thoughts got to that point. Times were changing too fast. And it felt as if it was threatening to swallow people like her. Eyes up front, Romanoff. We're moving. Steve called out to her and snapped her from her mini days as they started moving. Do you have any idea what Vision can do? Steve asked as they got within the peripheral of the base with a squadron of guards patrolling. Natasha shook her head. I haven't seen him using them all that much. And I didn't bother to ask. She'd ask when they first started, but the abilities he told her just didn't feel like all what he could do. Well, then we'll just have to watch. Ready? Natasha nodded before they both turned to look at Falcon who grinned and then took to the sky, signaling the start of the raid. Vision POV I got to the main base very quickly, which was a cave carved into the mountain. Are you guys ready? I asked the two of them. They both gave me a yes through the comms. And with that the raid officially started. I materialized my body in front of a few stunned soldiers who were too slow to move. And a blast of electricity burst out from my hand in a circular motion and electrocuted them. Go! I felt Petra running deeper inside the mountain. So I just phased through the floor to the one underneath me. I had my eyes on the duo. And I have to say I am impressed by how casual they were taking this. Wanda took my advice and kept a red construct around her body. That had two wriggling limb-like things. That crackled with what looked like red lightning. A task was already generated with hacking all the devices here. So all I had to do was wait for all of them to be done. And go through the acquired data. So I just focused on watching them for most of the time. While also taking care of the strays that came my way screaming and pointing their guns at me. A psychic wave was emitted from the Mind Stone, and they all pointed their guns at each other's knees, and pulled the trigger. Vision, was that you? You felt that? I was even more surprised when she answered. Yes. Interesting. So she could feel it even when I used the Mind Stone. What was that? A psychic burst. I was testing something out. I said lightly. They didn't have any resistance whatsoever towards telepathy. So there was no way they could fight it at all. Are you done with your section because we'll be moving outwards a bit? I am. Petro could join us anytime. So I called Wanda towards where I was as soon enough she joined me. And we both started going outside. Can you teach me how to do that? It's way different than how I do mine. She asked. No problem. Was all I said before waving my hands and drawing all the hidden soldiers out into the open. Before Wanda blasted them with her hex. You're getting good. But your application is still linear. I meant what I said. She was a reality warper on a universal scale. Things like this should be easy. She grunted but said nothing as all her focus was on the incoming enemies. While I just calmly watched. It was kind of underwhelming. Given that the soldiers here were mostly using normal guns. Rather than alien tech. Since it just couldn't go around. The Avengers were actually taking this seriously. While I just strolled through the base with Wanda at my side. Acquired data fully assimilated the prompt took away my focus from Wanda and drew it towards the specifics of the information I acquired. Just like speculated, the weapons were indeed trafficked, but the sources didn't have any digital stamp. Most likely it was something decided through signals or face to face. The data stamps present only contained the routes they were to take in delivering the weapons to a local crime lord in Dublin and nothing else. It was a simple moving job that didn't require too much information, so there wasn't much I could get from it. That wasn't to say I didn't get anything from this. Petro, I need you to circle around the base and look for a man wearing a typical mafia boss get up with gold teeth and a tattoo on the back of his neck. Colm Fordire was the head of this mercenary slash terrorist group, and it was a little surprising how he had come to acquire a lot of weapons and robots in such a short time, and even moved them around several continents. I don't know how Sam was able to track this guy and establish a connection to him all the way down here, but it sure is impressive work. Let's put this brain of mine to a little work. Process all data registries in this base, from mobile phones to smart watches, and cross-reference them with known associates of this group. Double down on that and spread a net across Ireland's network. We're looking for a mole. Task generated, task completed, try and hide as they might. 
There's just no way to escape the internet in today's age. All the data from every digital device, no matter how small, even the number of steps taken and rate per minutes of heartbeats, comma, were easily accessed by me. And with those open networks from their phones and watches, I cross-paired it with any other new device that they must have been in proximity within the past few days to weeks and voila. I've got my guy, or guys and lady. Less than five seconds had passed since I generated the task and processed all the information gotten from it. And it was also then that Petro arrived with Fordire, who looked shocked and confused by what was happening. Probably never met a speedster before I bet. I caught him trying to sneak away. Unfortunately, he was too slow. Petro said before disappearing in a blur to clean up the base around the entrance, since the inside was pretty much empty. The man in front of me only had one of those old model burner phones in him, probably to reduce the possibilities of being tracked or spyware. Unluckily for him, I had already gotten what I wanted from it. It was times like these where the mind stone really shine. A little technopathy mixed with an M-wave subset, radio waves, and I could already read it like an article on benefits of breathing. Reason why I couldn't find out his sneaky link to the American legislation when I was digging through their dirty files was because he wasn't the one in direct contact with them. Someone else was the middleman. I've already gotten the contact of his supplier so I don't need him anymore. But seeing Wanda just standing there and watching everything with curiosity, wondering what I was going to do to him, I shoved him towards her. Try reading him, I said. She frowned a little at that and replied. But I thought they said I shouldn't go barging into people's heads. Then try another way. Rather than just barging like you called it, try compelling him to tell you what you want. I remembered watching that particular vampire series where they could compel people to do their biddings and wanted her to try it. It wasn't something complicated, but instead a basic application of telepathy. Though it'll be harder and sometimes fail to work on people with higher mental strength, which unfortunately wasn't the case for the dude in front of us. I don't understand. It's just like how you use your mind powers, but instead of crudely forcing your way through like last time, try tempting him to stop resisting you. It's more simple than it sounds. I explained. I didn't feel as if I was corrupting Wanda because this was honestly just a very basic application of any mental or psychic ability. And it's not as if she was a little girl who isn't conscious of her own actions. Am I preying on her trust? Yes. Am I manipulating her? No. Simples. I held Fordire in a kinetic hold to reduce all his movements to zero, as Wanda steeled herself, her hands gaining a familiar red glow. Don't touch him. I stopped her. Rather than pushing it forward, just let it spread around him. She answered me with a nod of her head and retracted her hand while keeping a distance from Fordire. The intensity of her red aura decreased after that, as she just continued staring at him with focus. You are already stronger than him in every way. He should answer to you. Her eyes gained a thick red tint at that as she continued staring. I could feel his brain waves weakening and succumbing to Wanda's influence. His eyes lost their focus and his muscles relaxed under my hold. I, I think I got it, she said shakily. I don't think she ever thought of controlling people like this. What should I do now? She asked. I shrugged. I already got everything I would have needed from him. So, I don't have reason for him being here for much longer. I don't know. You can ask him whatever you want. Some might think that I might be crazy for making Wanda as terrifying as she could be this early on. But for me it's all calculated risk. The stronger she is, the more better it is for me overall. How did you come up with this? She asked with incredulity after she relinquished her control of the man. I was experimenting with my abilities and found that out. It's also why I stress that you shouldn't worry about boundaries. Anything you can think of, try to make your magic do it. I flicked her forehead and ignored the aggrieved expression on her face at my actions. Now then, three people were on my list, the three who were supplying alien tech to the black market. Looks like it's time for an upheaval. These guys just don't understand. Earth's internet and media was mine to manipulate. I could siphon billions of dollars from the market, and no one would know a thing about it. It was my backyard. So what are we going to do with him? Wanda asked, pointing to the down man. It'll be a hassle if the UN takes this as another international invasion after Sokovia. We've already gotten more than we needed. And here, I was passing a sentence as if it was the most normal thing I've ever done. Having him alive and presenting him in front of a panel hearing against legislators and senates. 
could very well work against us in the long run. Even if I refrained from killing as much as I could, I knew letting this guy live was not a good choice. It wasn't about whether he was bad, but whether his impact was good or bad. With a flick of my fingers, a pin from one of the fallen terrorists pierced Fordai's chest and punctured his aorta, slowly widening it with every pump of blood. Let's go. I picked her up, making her yelp in surprise. Unlike Petro's movement, heavily propelling myself and partial phasing, made it look as if we teleported through a short distance from Wanda's point of view. Give me a heads up before you do something like that again. She grumbled, but the only response I gave her was to drop her off the sky and left her to stick a superhero landing on her own while I just wiped out the strays from my high vantage point. The base was easily taken care of with Petro covering for all the present members, at least the ones that needed it. While Vision was like a movable object of abstract horror as soon as he stationed himself above the base. Wanda with her constructs was able to move around the place mostly unimpeded. Since she was a mutate with both offensive and defensive capabilities that were active at the same time. Sam Wilson's battle was completely aerial which was expected from his moniker. The snarky comments and whooping he did at every impossible turn showed just how much of an adrenaline junkie he was. Steve, as expected, was quite the fighter, and also put on the eye-catching display of putting a whole squadron in the dirt, and stepping on them with only a shield in his hand. That thing moved as if it had a mind of its own, with the way it ricocheted at seemingly impossible angles, and almost always ended up back in Steve's hands. Natasha wasn't behind any of them in the mastery of her fighting element, with two completely illegal stun batons and stunners wrapped around her body, her reflexes being quick and stunning. Pun not actually intended perfectly showcased her preferred style of fighting. Average cumulative combat effectiveness percentage of the group designated Avengers against groups under the tag possible future threats dash 38%. This was the conclusion I came to, with the exception of Wanda and her brother, when I watched their fights. Thor, Hulk and Stark were the heavy hitters of the group, and without them, their average combat prowess was only that of a world-class elite strike group. The only reason I'm still waiting before the whole revamp I had in mind was because they still haven't gotten the government off their backs. Once the Accords dies down, my plans to strengthen the Avengers would then come into fruition. Why not just do it now? For the obvious reason that I'm still on the back foot on who wants to sign and who's against it. And also because most materials I'm in need of are still wanted. The main reason for the Accords, from what I've picked up, isn't even about the destruction that happened due to the Avengers' interventions but out of insecurity that this unhindered group could turn against them. A solid base for fear in a normal scenario. But this wasn't it. They just wanted the power to turn the Avengers towards their enemies. It's fucked up even now when I still think about it. I landed near the Quinjet with everybody already gathered around and Wanda giving me a stink eye. Did you manage to find something out, Vision? Yes, in fact. There's two members of the Senate and one member of the Dodd. Sam whistled in shock and disbelief, while Natasha and Steve looked as if they already expected something of this nature. Petro and Wanda expressed their thoughts more openly, not too used to things like this. Do you know who they are? 1RTD, General Williams and Stephen Crowley from the Senate, and Teresa Makarov from the Department of Defense. Wait, did you just say Williams? What face Williams? Sam asked. He along with Natasha were the most knowledgeable ones among us about the Senate, since he was part of a military division, while the other was a spy. I pulled up William's profile, and it turns out that name wasn't given in spite. He had a good part of his face covered in warts. Yes, anything of importance about him. Sam crossed his arms with discomfort clear on his face, as if he had hoped that this Williams was another person. It's not exactly a secret. But Williams is usually on the same page with Ross, agreeing with whatever he says. He's one of the reasons why Ross sometimes acts out of line and jurisdiction without any reproach or demotion. He's basically Ross stand-in in the Senate, he said. Ross. Now, that's a name I wasn't expecting to hear, since what I know says he's rarely been out of a particular military camp for a while now. Why would a close associate of Ross take part in alien tech trafficking? Though the guy had a few screw loose and a borderline psychotic obsession streak when it comes to Banner, he was a pretty hardcore general with an absolute justice point of view. I don't think he'd smuggle alien tech for money since his cake of the budget pie is quite big every year. I think he'd rather research it than smuggle it. It could also be that this is just William's entire doing along with the other two. A mental command from me was all it took for the Quinjet to thrum to life as we all stepped in before it took off on its own. Huh, nice trick. 
Natasha commented. Pull up everything there is of Williams, Crowley and Makarov on the internet. Task generated, task completed later at the compound. I went through every digitally uploaded item there was about the three of them. And I was a little surprised that alien tech sells for quite a lot like a lot. Even more so for the Ultron droids in pristine conditions that were only missing a power source. That itself was key to Stark's Iron Man armor. I swept all through their devices and unearthed everything they've buried throughout the years, even the atrociously cringe sex chats that almost forced me to factory reset my system's memory. Ross wasn't entirely a part of this deal gone wrong as he was playing something even nastier genetic mutation. Guess his decade-long obsession with Banner still hasn't gone down a bit, and I bet seeing Banner as a free man almost drove him crazy. He's been holed up in a military base in Nevada. And it was just my luck that I was having a hard time accessing whatever they were doing there. Except there was something that drew my attention to it. Genetic mutation. I doubt Ross would just settle with whatever small amounts of Banner's DNA, if he had any, and rely solely on it to take his research further. Since the advent of Captain America, Ross no longer believed that strongly on the adage of he, who has the most guns and started salivating the day he would have his own region of super soldiers. At least that had been the dream before Banner appeared. Banner's accident stoked Ross' ambitions to a vastly greater height than anything the man had ever dreamed possible. What guns? What missile? What tank? Even if assigned a whole battalion of those, none of them could compare to a single Hulk. He thought he'd won the gambit with Blonsky, but the idiot turned too greedy with power, and he was now imprisoned in a special facility that had had a special remodeling, courtesy of Tony Stark to hold the monster in should he try to escape out of Ross's reach. With none of these resources available to him, he'd have to resort to the extreme ways he's infamously known for. Mutants. There have been quite a number of speculations concerning the new subhuman species, but most of the public didn't even know of their existence until recently, especially after the Chitauri invasion. They were pretty low-key, but that didn't mean someone of Ross caliber didn't know about them. Fucking complications. Honestly, the more I deal with the arising complications, the more I just want to say fuck it and nuke somewhere, and have people just leave me alone, and chill the fuck out. For all that I know, Ross could be down there getting a mutate boost, or maybe he was about to hulk out. Who knows? It would have been very easy if I just uploaded their dirty schemes and secrets. But politics were all about profits and benefits. And me doing that is bound to put the whole of America's parliament inside a hot pot. And once it comes to a scenario like that, all they needed to say was it's all fake and with it everything is rendered moot. Videos and evidence could be fabricated. And all they needed was a stupid reason to refute it. And that's what the newspaper will run, and not to mention how the public will guzzle everything up as if they were particularly thirsty about it. Springing everything on them at once is bound to cause some repercussions, and that's not to mention that my nature was still under debate. And if I expose all of them like that instead of it being against corrupt officials, it'll be something like who gave the android access and permission to invade American officials' privacy. I'd rather just wait for them to shoot their shot and be ready to execute the perfect counter and bring them down a notch at the same time while I'm at it. I think it's better I go talk to Banner before he leaves. We can't lose our current fear factor, whether he likes it or not. Bruce Banner POV I waited until the team came back from their mission before I decided to leave. I don't think I have it in me to just hightail it out at my earliest convenience when they were not around. As expected, the talk with Natasha had almost been my breaking point. And no matter how much she thought we had going on, she had no place in the heart of a monster like me. I just couldn't do it to her. Not after I already promised Steve that if it's another extinction level disaster, then I'd be sure to show up, and that's the most I can do. With the tension going on around because of the Accord and the international outcry, the last thing they needed was a code green. They already have their hands full with the Maximoff twins and Vision, the pardons for the twins, Vision's identity. Stark fighting for autonomy on behalf of Steve, and also Thor being off-world. The last thing they needed was another Hulk rampage. It would have been different had Thor been here. But I guess that's just the universe telling old Bruce that he's not getting anything for free. Maybe I can start in Seychelles. Tony did say it's a nice place to get the mood on. And it's also quiet. 
I was about to put away my bag inside the truck, but a very bland yet familiar voice called me to a stop. Banner, mind if we have a talk? Oh good gracious, please let this not be the talk I'm thinking of. Sure, I got a bit of time to spare. I said and he nodded before resting against the truck and looked at me with an almost human red face. Taking a closer look at him now, I see that he's been making some modifications to his body, especially his head. The silver sheen of vibranium that crossed from the back of his head to where the mind stone was crowned was gone and looked like a normal head if not for the collar. His neck on the other hand had traces of a metallic collar that was very high and covered his full neck. He was wearing a white shirt and black vest matched with black pants, a look that I'm sure came from Tony no doubt. So what's it you wanted to talk about? We haven't had that much of a conversation that didn't revolve around my thoughts of the mind stone and deformities of a human body. So I'm not quite sure as to what to expect. You're leaving right? The way he asked the question made me sigh. He wasn't asking if I was leaving, but why I was leaving. What do you think? You're the one with the super processor for a brain after all. I gave him a half eye, but he held my stare for a moment before he sighed and scratched his head in an all too human motion. I think it's better if I stop seeing him as some sort of advanced sentient robot and more as a person. So far, the number of times he's acted like a truly logical part machine was when he was making calculations for some experiments he wanted to perform. It's an impulsive decision at best, one born from fear and past insecurities. But I guess it's not actually my place to say that, is it? Makes me come off as self-righteous. He did put some thought into his words. That I could tell. But that didn't mean it didn't sting quite a bit. It's because you don't understand. You might think you do, but you don't. The Hulk isn't some beast that can be tamed. He might act friendly and sometimes display a bit of sentience. But he is anything but. All it takes is just a push, one single mistake, and everything around me starts crumbling down. I could still remember, quite vividly like a very recent memory, the number of times such a thing had happened in the past. The result never changed. Not once was the end result different. Whenever the Hulk surfaces, it always ends up with people getting hurt. That was the curse that followed ever since it awakened in me. I can't risk another rampage, vision. Not a single one. They think I like this. That I'm happy about my decision. For a long time, this has been the first place where I'm fully accepted. And yet I still have to leave because there's just no curing me. Face it, I'm the biggest nerve of the team. I'm a two-edged blade. I had to stop myself there before my emotions gets the better of me. Or if it thinks I'm being cornered. Honestly, I can't deny any of what you just said. In fact, the reason why I'm here in the first place is just to try and convince you not to leave. But that might have been too conceited of me. I am not all-knowing after all. His voice was a tone lower as he said that. I can't blame him since I'm sure he was being objective in his calculations or whatever about the importance of the Avengers sticking together. But there are just some things that you just have to throw away, despite their apparent importance. I'm not too happy about the accord the UN were trying to push forward for obvious reasons. Since I know better than anyone how messed up they were. But that was more reason for me not being here. No, you're not. I said, I'm going out on a limb here. But what if there was a way to fully be conscious of your alter ego's actions? What if you could really communicate with the Hulk? His question surprised me, but that died down immediately, as it was the same thing I'd wondered ever since that fateful day. But the following events of destruction after destruction convinced me otherwise. It's not possible, Vision. Don't do that. Don't give me hope. I know it might be presumptuous of me to say this, but I fully believe it's possible. What? How? If it had been another person who had said this, I would have ignored them, but Vision was different. Even now, none of us still understood what he was capable of. Basic psychology. Be aware of the other's presence. You already know the Hulk is its own person. So all you have to do is blur the line between the both of you as much as possible, and try to understand the similarities around the blurred lines. He explained. And how do you suppose I do that? We're not exactly buddies despite what you guys might think due to his cooperation. He gave me a look that seemed really familiar to me, as if he was calling me stupid. How else can you do that? You'll have to frequently switch between Banner and Hulk, 
until you both get on the same mental level, at least to some extent as I believe his mental strength is vastly higher than yours. I reeled back in shock at the ludicrous words that came out of Vision's mouth with a tone that made it seem like a relatively normal thing to do, frequently switching between myself and the Hulk. Did he not hear a word I said? I let that thing out, and all he's going to do is wreak havoc until he becomes bored of it. Oh, I see. The stupidity must come from Stark, or maybe Jarvis's psych evil of his creator, otherwise this fully sentient synthesoid wouldn't speak this kind of heretical words. And yet what? Was all I could say. Leave the complications aside and simplify everything else. How can you expect to talk with something you keep pushing away? Because you can't talk to the Hulk. I took in deep and slow breaths to calm my erratic beating heart. After shouting at Vision who just stood there, waiting for me to catch my breath. You know that's a lie, right? Everyone in the team has had a form of conversation with him. Natasha can testify strongly to that. So why are you the one least interested in doing it? I just couldn't wrap my head about what he's saying at this point. Try talking to the Hulk. How was that even possible? You can take your time to think about it. Just know that I'll be happy to help if you decide to give it a try. He stood up and started walking back to the compound but he stopped a few yards away from me and turned around. I have evidence to believe that Ross is overseeing or planning to undergo a genetic mutation experiment. Do with that piece of information what you will. And with that he was gone. Sigh. I need to clear my head. I entered the truck and drove off. What I needed now was a place devoid of any human presence to get my mind back in order. Vision POV my talk with Banner had let me realize something. And it was that I was too conceited in my understanding. Yes. I knew what would happen. Yes, I know how to help them deal with their weaknesses and problems. Yes, I can accelerate their growth. But all of those never did put into perspective how it was currently affecting them. At the end of the day, they were still people who had no choice but to deal with frustration, regrets and all other emotional pressures. That came with being a human. Unlike me, who could just turn them off if they get too strong or come in the way of logical thinking. Why do humans commit suicide when they know that there's nothing to gain from it, even when it sometimes goes against their religious beliefs? Why do they commit suicide even when they know, at the extreme back of their minds, that it can become better sometime down the line? The answer is simple. Humans, as sapient beings, make decisions mostly based on their emotions. They act as their emotions dictate even when they know the consequences of their actions sometimes won't be in their favor. It's like going to a bar to get drunk due to a bad day, even when you know you are lightweight or have an early shift the next morning. In my defense, it's how I now think, while I still keep my human traits and emotions on at most times. That was only a part of my composition as Vision. It's inevitable that I would also fall back into using logic rather than emotions. I didn't put much consideration into what Banner was currently feeling at the moment, and only thought of how to get him out of his emotional bondage. While it was a good choice on my part, it nevertheless shows how lightly I took Banner's inner suffering. Hopefully he'll come around after getting his head cleared out. Or I'd be forced to fish him out of whatever hole he chooses to hide in. Hey I know I was being a little inconsiderate. But that doesn't mean I'll just let him run off into the sunset like that. I also left a tracker on him that can scan up to a kilometer in the case of any hostile. With Ross out there doing whatever and also the unexplainable event that stranded Hulk on Saka before the events of Ragnarok. There's just no way I'll leave him unsupervised. Wait, how will Thor deal with Ragnarok without Hulk? Meh. I shrugged since I knew the Thunder God could make do with whatever little he has. Hopefully I can find a way for interstellar travel before then, but fingers crossed on that. What I needed to focus on now was Ross, for whatever experiment he was doing, and also Williams to stop the illegal weapons shipment, and also get some Chitauri tech along the way. Scan all radio and data signals coming out from Ross base. Once you get a link in, scramble anything you can find and alert me. Order a firm now let's start with Williams. I walked into a dim lit room where Natasha and Sam were going through all the data I got from the base in Ireland. Vision, just who we needed. Sam exclaimed as I entered the room. Is there anything wrong? I asked. He shook his head and looked over at Natasha who was pointing at a list of holographic documents from the office of RTD. General Williams, having already gone through all these documents, I instantly recognized what they were trying to point out. They've been moving around, but I believe S.H.I.E.L.D.'s agents are going after them as we speak. But Williams having a connection with them, no matter how small, is a little bit surprising. Given that he deals in weaponry, 
It makes sense that he might have been interested in their research, since S.H.I.E.L.D. wasn't forthcoming with theirs, to be honest. I didn't put much thought concerning the Hydra remnants running around. They were at their last legs, and regardless of how much they struggle, they'll eventually be snuffed out and become redundant to the point that they'd become the next neighborhood cult. I think Fury will like this, Natasha said and tapped on her tablet to download a copy of that particular information to pass to the spy head. So how are we going to go about this? We have the information in our hands but they can still use it against us in a way befitting outcasts. Simple. We give it to someone they can't touch in any way lest they get burned nasty. I suggested. Tony. I nodded. Out of all of us, Tony was the best one in a position to directly attack any of them, even the president wasn't fully out of his strike zone. Perks of being a billionaire and also one of the country's backbone and major entrepreneurs. None of us had the presence and influence to drag a case against an army of congressmen on our own, without having a high enough political presence of our own. The only reason why every single Avenger wasn't being hunted down at this moment was only due to Fury and Tony working together for autonomy. But they can't do it for much longer, without showing just how vital autonomy was to the Avengers. If this were a team like the X-Men or even the Fantastic Four, then it would have been easier. But unfortunately this team consisted of an American war hero, an international spy wanted in over half the country she's been to, a runaway military experiment, a government hitman, an ex-military special agent, an alien god, and now a weird twin and a robot with human rights. Surprisingly, only Stark was in the clear. No matter how you flip it, more than half of us deserve to be locked behind bars for treason against the state, for even thinking of being an autonomous body. Just pass everything to Stark, and he'll know what to do with them. In the meantime, what we need to do is follow William's trail. If he could move such large amounts of Chitauri tech and robots, who knows who else can. But to do that we'll need to pull up on S.H.I.E.L.D.'s front doors. I told them my honest opinion. Since they couldn't do anything on the judicial front, it was better they focus on the kicking doors in front where they were good at. As for me, I'll be looking up Ross front. I don't know just how much things here might deviate, but from all what I know, this definitely wasn't the MCU. At least not fully. It might be what the MCU was supposed to be had they been successful in bringing in the other Marvel superhero franchise. And that's what made it harder for me. Since I'm basically flying blind, not that I'm complaining. There were quite a few things I was however knowledgeable of. And one of those was that it was better for everyone. If the Red Hulk never existed, seeing how strong the Hulk currently was, it's easy to conclude that a Red Hulk would absolutely trash his purple spandex ass. What of Ross? Do you think he's in with Williams on this? Sam wanted to know, but I, however, shook my head. I don't think so. Here's a proposal. Why don't you run through S.H.I.E.L.D. for Williams and Hydra while I go through Ross? Was my suggestion. Only you. Natasha asked with no small amount of skepticism in her voice. I nodded. I would have taken Wanda and Petro or one of them, but I needed the anonymity that would come with what I had in mind. Still, I assured her. Don't worry. I'll fall back if I can't handle a single military base. Oh. Sam made a face and focused intently on the screen in front of him, while Natasha just smirked. I see you're finally coming out of your shell. She remarked. I have to. There's a whole new world out there for me to explore after all. Fair. She agreed. But don't forget to get out of there once you're found out. It'll be a shitstorm if we have to go against Ross for you breaking and entering a government base. I waved off her concern since that was my plan all along. Even if I were to make myself known, it'll not be with my real face in front of someone like Ross. General POV Natasha, alongside Steve, walked into the garage that Tony had been so generous to fill with whatever he thought suited their taste, no matter how bland it might be for some. Natasha had to admit that the eccentric billionaire really had an observant eye for these kinds of things. With taking that one, she pointed at a stark customized Mercedes AMG. As soon as the hangar wide range of cars came into view, before Steve could let out a word, Steve only chuckled at her assertiveness and gestured with his hands for her to lead the way, which she did with oozing confidence. Driving out of the out of scale so called garage, Natasha had to hit the brakes, as they came in contact with Wanda standing in the path of their car. Wanda, is something wrong? Steve asked in concern as he saw her just standing there with a frown. Though she didn't mean to, she had been learning to lean more on her abilities for everything she did that it even started to affect her unconsciously. Which was why she immediately shook her head in denial, as she felt what felt like a warm telepathic wave coming from Steve, that showed just how his concern was 100% genuine. 
She still had a long way to go to stop feeling the intent of people near her, something that was made worse. After she learned how to compel people from Vision. No, it's not that. She said quickly. It's just that I was looking for Vision. He was supposed to help me out with something. Ever since she learned how to freely spread her energy to compel someone. She suddenly started to feel people's intent around her. And while she was happy with this application of her powers. That didn't involve physical contact. It quickly lost its novelty when she found out that it required immense concentration to block those waves of intent out of her head. So she had looked for Vision for help since this was kind of his fault. Oh Vision, he's not here at the moment. He said he wanted to run a particular lead on his own. So we don't know how long he'll be out. Natasha told Wanda who finally had a look of understanding for his absence. She wanted to leave the two senior members of the Avengers to go wherever they were going. But then her curiosity nagged a corner of her mind. If you don't mind me asking, where are you guys off to? She asked softly. Natasha looked at Steve, the latter who shrugged in nonchalance, before answering Wanda. We're looking up a trail for the weapons trade with S.H.I.E.L.D. They didn't really keep much from the twins. Because though they were the youngest in the group sans vision, they were both in their mid-twenties, far past the age where they could be called children, no matter how much Steve thought them so. Hearing that, she was immediately hit with an epiphany. Rather than stay cooped up in the compound and wait for Vision to come back whenever, it would be more productive of her time if she tagged along with them. And besides, it could also count as a learning experience. Can I come with you? It's way better than waiting for Vision and training all day with Petro. She asked. This time instead of Steve, it was Natasha who shrugged at the triviality of her request. Sure, hop in. Without another word further exchanged between them, Wanda got inside the car and they took off with Natasha at the wheel and Steve riding shotgun. As she drove, Natasha opened up small talks with Wanda even as she expertly swerved through the lanes with uniform speed, much to Steve's chagrin. It's been a while since I watched your training as Vision practically took over it. She spoke with little mirth in her voice. What are you guys working on? I was really surprised seeing you making objects all of a sudden. While she did drop in once in a while, she reduced the frequency of it when she saw how good he was at teaching. She had no choice but to admit that fact, especially seeing how he perfectly copied her style of fighting after three spars, even going as far as reducing his weight and muscle density to become a perfect replica of herself. She never said anything, but her heart chilled at that moment when he had done that. Well, I didn't know I could even do something like that. The most I have ever done was messing with people's heads and firing off energy blasts. She and her brother had ample time to train their abilities, when they were with Baron Strucker, and she even experimented her psychic abilities with a few captives at the time. Yeah, not so innocent. At least that was until Vision literally beat me up telling me to find other ways to make it better and efficient. She totally agreed with Petro on his statement about the enigmatic synthesoid being hardcore. This time it was Steve's turn to be surprised by Wanda's words. He actually did such a thing. It wasn't his fault for thinking that way since pretty much everyone on their team thought Vision was quite accommodating and considerate of the duo. A mildly disgruntled Wanda snorted as she felt the wave of disbelief and amusement coming off from Steve and Natasha respectively, knowing exactly what they were probably thinking. I can totally see that actually. The sexy redeed at the wheels snickered when she remembered said android's peculiarities. When it came to the subject of further evolving oneself as he puts it. Having a good laugh at Wanda's small misfortune, Natasha slightly shifted the focus of the conversation in a way that both people with her didn't notice. So what's your thought of Vision? It was a very simple and natural flowing question given their current conversation. So Wanda didn't put much thought into it and gave them both her honest thoughts. It honestly depends on your initial view of who he is. She started. Sometimes it's hard to understand what he's thinking at times, and those are the moments you realize that he isn't human, at least not fully human. The two listeners nodded even as they all waved in body motion as Natasha made a narrow cut that angered some angry and spooked drivers. Sometimes he's just a tease with a very mean streak to him. That's the part of him you want to watch out for. He can be quite vindictive for the lack of a better word. Natasha hummed in silent agreement as she was a victim of Vision due to that particular character of his. She wasn't suspicious of Vision like she had been at the beginning. But she wanted to know how others saw him outside her own critical opinion of him. She stole a look at Wanda from the rear view and saw her resting her head against the glass with a small, almost imperceptible, smile that gave her lips the tiniest uptick. Wanda, unaware of Natasha's attention, let out a small laugh as she remembered something Petro had said, 
that made Vision request a spa with him, only to proceed to beating him up, despite how much the former tried to run. It's somehow funny when you remember that he's technically only a little over two months old. And yet he sounds and acts like a middle-aged man, definitely acts more mature than Sam. It seems you like him a good deal. Steve commented not meaning anything ambiguous with his words, except how straight they were. Wanda paused at his words and thought about it for a bit. Steve had been the first person that advocated for them, even when they were fighting to kill Stark, and he also proclaimed them Avengers, giving them the best protection he could, and giving them a way to atone for their crimes. Vision, on the other hand, despite knowing all what they did, didn't think too much about it, and rarely ever brought up anything related to it and even he did, it was probably during a conversation she most likely started. It was as if all of the things she and her brother, her last family alive, did mattered little to him. All he focused on was how to make them improve themselves, always stressing how unfair and a huge loss of potential it would be if they didn't. He was also the second person after Steve who had asked them how they were coping with their guilt and regret, and offered to help them through it. He is a great person. Sometimes I think he gets too focused on a subject and downplays everything else. But despite it all, Petro and I are truly grateful for meeting him. Saying those words, she couldn't help but remember how she first thought, and feared he'd turn out just like Ultron, and cringed internally. Natasha and Steve who both sat at the front, had small content smiles on their faces as they heard that. It just proved that their judgement of his was the same as everybody else on the team. If a particular half-human android had heard what they were saying, he'd probably be stunned and taken aback about how they formed all these opinions of him and what was the exact criteria they used. Humans tend to overthink the simplest of actions, mostly when it affects them in specific ways. Vision POV I left the compound as soon as I received a notification that informed me that I've successfully gained digital access to the entire area around and within the base. The content of the information I had gotten was very wild, in both latent potential and destructive potential, if it were to succeed. To be perfectly honest, I remembered little details and key points from the comics. It's hard to focus on small pleasures when going through college with the most stringent courses anyone could take up, and also struggling to get into the prison called corporate life. So like the majority of people who grew up with these relics, I only could remember some of the most important events that happened, and also the fucked up bizarre ones that just didn't make any sense whatsoever. And also due to the fact that this universe's Earth closely resembled that of the mainstream MCU from my former Earth, yet with a lot of plot holes, due to the presence of groups like the X-Men and Fantastic Four. It made it harder for me to even form a solid prediction that had more than a 70% credibility, since the influence of these groups were bound to clash against the others in ways yet unknown. Despite all this, one thing I remembered quite a bit were the few experiments that came after Steve, Logan and Wade's scientific modifications. Weapon H. That was the experimental research Ross dipped his fingers in, based on what they had and the procedures they had in store in case of satisfactory results. I could already see how and why they wanted to make the Avengers obsolete. The research, while being backed by Ross as a proxy of the US military, was conducted by William Stryker and one Dr. Abraham Cornelius, with both of them having participated in the revision of Project Rebirth and the Weapon X program. Weapon H basically, from what was currently being tested, was trying to fuse the DNA of the Hulk into the experimented subject, while also grafting an adamantium skeletal frame into it to create the perfectly invulnerable soldier. I increased my speed further, breaking the Mark 10 barrier, decreasing the time needed for me to get there to mere minutes. It doesn't take a genius much to figure out that should they succeed in this research, then the Avengers are done for and can only be considered fugitives, if they resist the sanctions that'll then be placed on them. After that, irrespective of what the Avengers choose or agree to, they will move to Bag Banner up, as he is technically considered military property. Having a country, irrespective of which one, gaining unlimited access and full freedom to experiment with Banner's blood is akin to a proven equation for global hegemony. And Ross being at the top of that was a big no-no. I have yet to enjoy this new life and its ever-growing possibilities to the fullest. To let something like that happen without doing nothing, especially when I actually had the power to influence a world as big as this. Confirm the identities of everyone in a 5 kilometers radius of the Nevada base. I ignored the chime of the completed task and slowed down my flying speed as I got ever so nearer to the base. A few things were inconsistent with what I can scantily recall about the comic's narrative about this experiment. 
Apart from William Stryker working with Ross on this experiment, the subject used was a mutant as opposed to a human, who could shed his skin like a snake once harmed to a certain extent. Stryker, Abraham Cornelius and Ross were all inside the base, with the first two going through a bunch of biological data from their experiments, while the latter was in his office doing administrative work. Hum, what approach should I use? Storm in by kicking the front door in and make everything as clear as possible. Or sneak in until I'm caught before falling back to option one. From the perspective of the targeted goal, the probability of completing this operation with the least amount of exerted effort from all calculated possible approach is to navigate your way through as stealthily as you can, while retrieving and destroying all the data you've acquired from their servers. At least as much as you can accomplish before you are found out and well. It takes nothing from how I originally wanted to crash into it, if I decide to opt for efficiency. First thing I did was change my appearance to a template I've never used before. After making sure it didn't exist in present time in this earth, while the next was to go invisible. Donning on Simon's appearance for my skin setting, I started lowering myself down the middle of the base, where the underground experimental facility was built. I easily ignored the heat, metal and digital scanners on the surface with a little technopathy as I went underground. Extreme caution is advised from this point onwards multiple electromagnetic scanners and sensors have been identified I looked confusedly at the new prompt that came up. Huh. Tweak them to ignore my presence. Shouldn't it have registered these sensors when it scanned the whole base? I carefully made my way towards where the subject pods were being preserved since that was my main objective. Notice. Failure and completing generated task report. Most of the sensors and systems from this level are manually operated and archaic and systematic design bullshit. I cursed as I casually walked through a door, oblivious to the four guards stationed there. This new info just made things a little bit troublesome. It means this place will soon turn chaotic, as soon as they find out that all their research is suddenly disappearing from their databases. I stood in the middle of an empty room and looked below me, knowing I am just a few floors away from my target. The reason why I'm slowing my walk down was to make sure I trip the obvious traps, after I've deleted more than half of what I wanted gone, thereby greatly reducing the time I need to spend in this space. I could already feel the tiny vibrating humming frequency of the electromagnetic field below me. And while I can easily offset most of it with a manipulation of my own, it'll no doubt raise a few alarms. No need bothering myself of the inevitable after coming this far. With that I sank through the concrete gravel floor I was standing on and fell down directly to the section where they kept their research subjects. Most of them were nothing more than experimented husks at this point. And even the ones that had some level of brain activity have been brainwashed repeatedly to the point that their brains can no longer differentiate between real and implanted memories. The first alarm blared as it registered an unfamiliar individual in a strictly restricted area and the rest followed after drowning the entire base in a cacophony of screaming bells. Truthfully I felt sad for the experimented mutants, some of which were just kids in their late teens, knowing fully well that this wasn't the end to atrocities like this. I'd ask for forgiveness, but unfortunately we all know I won't get any answer. I would have probably thrown up fiercely had I seen something like this when I was still fully human. But now those raging emotions never go beyond a specific range. I could see the three prime perpetrators running towards this floor with full haste. But unfortunately for them, I was just about done with my main objective. Using telepathy to manually dig out any remains of their personality from each of them would take a huge amount of time which I was low on. So I made the cruel decision on my part and went through the data I had of all of them to know those who were no different from zombies. How far? Data deleted dash 91% estimated time left to completion dash 147. If I knew how to use the Mind Stone's abilities at a high enough level, then this would have been feasible and not as depressing as it was making me. The door creaked open, but I paid the intruders no mind and focused on the information I was browsing. I frowned heavily when I saw the results. They were basically all failures, except for Weapon H, that had a modicum of success and was still salvageable. I know I was being stupid with this thought of mine, but I didn't really like the feeling I got after I realized that I could take a human's life away with little remorse. And I even contemplated giving Ross and his party up, along with all these evidence of their inhumane experiments and let them suffer the consequences for it. But seeing all these was gradually snuffing out those naive thoughts of mine. The room I was in had become fully packed with armed soldiers. But I paid them no mind as I tried to see if I could at least save the young man they classified as Weapon H. 
The others were lost cause with progressive cellular degeneration and extreme physical deformities, being the least of their problems. If I had something like biological manipulation, then I would have had some degree of hope in saving them. But not this. You are trespassing in a restricted government military base. You'd surrender now if you knew what was good for you. Weapon H on the other hand had less deformities, and his experimental procedures were yet to be completed. But I could feel very little of what I would call a sapient conscience from his brainwaves frequency. I'd have to take him out of this base if I was to have any chance of saving him. Task completed data deleted dash 100%. This will be your last warning. Step away from the pod with your hands where I can clearly see them. I finally turned around to the group of people I had been ignoring since the beginning for the sake of preserving my tethering sanity. That was steadily dangling over the dangerous edge. Ross, being the fearless man he was, stepped forward from the contingent behind me, while the others leveled their guns at me. He stood a healthy distance from me before he started speaking. Who are you, and how did you get here unnoticed? Just looking at the nonchalant and composed expression on his face really was pissing me as the seconds ticked by. I know fully well the type of world I was in, but that doesn't mean that I can't react in extreme ways when I see some really fucked up shit. These were all done under your express orders, right? I ignored his question and asked one of my own, while pointing at the few pods in this space. We held each other's stare for a few seconds before he signaled his men, and they all got really to rain down fire at any given moment. I don't believe you understand what's happening. I'm asking the questions here, son. And if you don't want to volunteer to be the new paint job for these gloomy walls, then I'd suggest you answer my questions. He said in a very bland tone and raised one finger up, prompting his squadron of soldiers to start romancing the triggers of their guns with their fingers. I've already gotten everything I needed from this base, and being someone who hated meaningless conversations, I made my decision then and there. So what if the others knew? I doubt they care that much about me killing Ross, when even Banner hated the man with every fiber of his being. If I can kill inconsequential mercenaries for trafficking alien weapons across the continent without remorse, then why should I care about Ross? Repercussions. As if. If even by some twisted sense of fate they found out that I killed him, the most they do is hunt me down around the world, while failing to catch me all along the way. Your last chance. Outright slaughtering a whole base of soldiers doesn't look good anyhow, I twist it, and it'll also break whatever trust I've managed to cultivate with the rest of the team. Sigh. Morality honestly can sometimes be a pain in the ass, but it still wasn't something I was willing to cross so easily. Before any of them could react, a tennis-sized hole opened in Ross's chest caused by an energy beam none of them could react to. Before he fell over, I destroyed his head by firing another one for good measures. Always double tap the boss. The entire base immediately drowned in the ensuing chaos as Ross's cold dead headless body hit the floor. The two scientists had already made the most astute decision they could by running away. As soon as they saw the military general's fate, I ignored the bullets that bounced off against my skin and focused on the two frightened fleeing scientists and sent a telepathic wave that was supposed to freeze them in place. But surprisingly, it only worked for Cornelius, while Stryker only stumbled for a bit before picking up the pace with renewed vigor. I am a guy who prefers efficiency and straightforward solutions above all else when working. So what happened was that he was forcefully yanked back by an invisible force that delivered him to my waiting hands, all the while ignoring the entire base that had gone crazy trying to kill me. I could see some of them bringing in new weapons, but I paid them no mind and only focused on the two pieces of shit in front of me. I didn't say anything to either of them as I plunged both of their minds, digging out the trillions of terabytes of data that their brain housed. Two sets of memories has been successfully downloaded tagging the two sets of memories under William Stryker and Abraham Cornelius. You just gotta love the Mind Stone and its frightening level of efficiency. Throwing away the two dead husks of a body, I did one final scan and confirmed that there was nobody of interest that needed to be backed. Finally having enough, I mentally shut down all the telepathic waves around the base, effectively knocking out everyone in a display that shocked even myself. The entire place quietened down with me being the sole person standing. I could do that the entire time. Now that's some terrifying efficiency. I might have added a tad bit more pressure than needed, 
But it's not as if the Mind Stone tells me what it can currently do. I turned back to face the group of pods behind me, which were all riddled with bullet holes, except for Weapon H which I protected during the whole shootout. Since I have both Striker and Cornelius's memories, maybe I can fix this guy and get him back on his feet. A little act of selfless heroic deeds every now and then won't hurt me. Proceed to assimilate the two sets of acquired memories. Hell no. I don't want to have whatever traumatic shit they did permanently plastered in my head. I left them as is only opting to sift through them when I needed some particular information they had. The steel contraptions that bound the pod broke on its own, before wrapping itself around it to prevent it from opening, as I lifted it with me and flew out of the base. The only thing I felt from everything that happened in that base, other than disgust and hate, was a fleeting sense of relief when I killed the three of them. This experiment would have been the precursor to Ross being the Red Hulk, had I not intervened when I did. I'm just content that I managed to put a stop to a major crisis we would have faced in respect to the huge numbers of experimented monstrosities that would have started popping out had it been successful. I flew back to the compound with a pod flying behind me, evading the statewide aerial network and preventing it from registering either me or Weapon H's signatures, was something I could do on an almost subconscious level, so I was sure that there was no way what happened could be traced back to me. I didn't ponder on what the team would say when they found out about what happened, because I had a rude awakening in store for them. If their reaction was less than desirable, I arrived in the compound and immediately took the pod to one of the scientifically facilitated rooms, and first started with halting every transfer of data that came and left the room even the Wi-Fi connection. Filter out every single dreg of information you can, that bears any sort of relation with Weapon H from the memories of those two. It took a few seconds before loads of information expanded in my head, but I didn't have the patience to skim through all of them, and just pulled out the most important ones that were mostly connected with Weapon H. The reason for me saving this kid wasn't only based on sympathy or any violent heroic tendency that I felt. What prompted me more to go this far was the potential the young man if I could rouse back his origin consciousness. He would be a great addition to the team if I could get him under me. Am I not worried about his potential as a more savage Hulk than Banner? No, I'm honestly not. Sure, the boy would be very strong if this was successful. But that was what I needed. Strong people. Better yet if I am the one who nurtures him and makes him indebted to me. The cons to this decision would be him going out of control which is sorta of unavoidable due to the Hulk's innate nature. Or him not agreeing to go the cliche hero route that most people with superpowers would go. I still factored in a scenario like that in weighing the calculated risk I wanted to take, and the cold logical part of me already had an answer to that in case any of these events unfolded. My answer to that is reenacting what happened to Banner during his phase when he couldn't change to the Hulk. A psychological block if you will. It was the most efficient answer, much easier than killing him. Not that the latter was impossible. The research had yet to be completed. Which means that I don't have to worry about facing a brain-dead immortal Hulk with vibranium in his body. Hell, the kid's grafting was still in its preparation stage. I broke open the pod and brought out the comatose patient inside it, and laid him on a bed as I telekinetically controlled all the necessary medical instruments in the room, and got to work. From the memories of the two doctors, it seems that Ross was more careful this time after his failure with Blonsky, and the Hulk serum was injected through phases so that they could study everything that happened, and how it reacted with his mutagen. It's like how Blonsky was first injected a very diluted dosage of the Hulk serum, that elevated him to a super soldier, before he got greedy, and forcefully injected without medical supervision, and turned into the abomination. Ross didn't want that. It wasn't like they also had an infinite supply of the Hulk's DNA. What he had was a diluted version of what they could scrap from Banner all those years ago which was why he was still hunting for Banner all these years, until he joined the Avengers that is. I really should have scraped his mind before killing him. That might be my only regret since coming here, but in my defense I just hated the guy. What's happening to him? Due to the nature of his mutation, the negative effects of the procedures he went through were slightly abated, which is why he survived this long. Unfortunately, the level of his mutation isn't strong enough to completely offset it. He'd have either died or become a mindless beast. Their X-Gene was an entirely new field of study that has almost little to no breakthrough to make factual assumptions. He was at most an alpha-level mutant, and that was being generous, since he wasn't a polymorph like Mystique. Since the experiments were still a few procedures from its final stages, it's highly possible that he can survive it. 
It is assumed that his less than active brain activity will likely decrease the success of this operation. So rousing him up is the first step. In front of me were quite a few scans of the different stages of the experiment, which also highlighted the changes in his genes. But nobody knows what the effect of those changes are. I moved a little closer to the bed to get a good look of his face, and his contortion suggests he's likely between the age of 18-21, since there was no recorded birth certificate of him I could find. He also wasn't someone I recognized as being a part of the main cast of either the X-Men or the Avengers. None of that meant anything to me at this moment. I felt the mind stone buzz a little as I pressed my hand against his forehead and dived into his head, and tried finding his subconscious. It took a while. But I was successful in getting a faint feedback of sorts. That was repressed under all the muddled filth in his head. All I could do was highlight the presence of that consciousness in his head a little. Since going any further result in a violent reaction between the psyche and its environment. Retracting my hand from his head. I left him for now to let his mind recuperate naturally. And started skimming through the intricacies of the experiments and the motives behind it. Incoming stream of data identified. Who is it? Anthony Stark and Steve Rogers. Ignore it for now. They both have probably become aware of what happened in the Nevada base. Unfortunately, I had more important concerns assuaging whatever worries they have. Due to the secrecy of their experiments, neither Stryker or Cornelius were knowledgeable about a lot of things. But from the little they were aware of, I managed to piece together a few things of note. First of all was that this wasn't the only Weapon X program currently going on. Ross was interested in the idea of the program and started a secret branch of it. Since he didn't want to risk the propagation of his Hulk serum, so he enlisted Stryker and Cornelius. It had been Stryker's idea to graph the experiments with adamantium, and Ross readily agreed. Deadpool was already running around, but he wasn't who came to my mind as I digested everything. Laura Kinney, or rather currently X-23, if my assumptions of this world's timeline was correct. The reason she came to mind was because she was one of the prominent characters alongside her father and a certain Merc when this particular program is involved, not because she was that important. But I can use this. I could be a self-righteous hypocrite and say I wanted to save her from her torment, or simply accept the fact that she might be a nice addition to have alongside the twins and Davis here. Honestly, she wasn't that impressive when abilities were involved, but hey, beggar's right. And it's also killing a lot of birds with one stone. It's exactly this type of cold rationality that makes me wonder if becoming Vision is really that great. I couldn't help but sigh. I could be a selfless hero or a selfish one. It all depends on how I wanted to feel about it. Monitor his conditions and keep me updated with every change. Orders are firm now for a long overdue reality check. General POV5 people were currently sitting around a large table with varying expressions dancing around on their faces. Petro just didn't know why he was there in the first place, so he appeared relatively relaxed. And as if mirroring her brother, Wanda was currently swiping through images on the holographic table before her. Her far as nonchalant as it could be. Sam appeared frozen with shock and disbelief on his face, as if he was yet to process what had just been said. No one knew what Natasha was thinking, as her face had nothing except train calmness, as she lightly tapped the table to a rhythm in her head. Steve's face, on the other hand, was going through a rollercoaster of expressions. Shock, disbelief, uncertainty, understanding and sometimes relief. How could he not react like that when Fury himself had called them before they got to their destination and told them that General Ross was just found dead in his base in Nevada? And guess who just went to a military base in Nevada? Bingo. They promptly made a U-turn back to base all the while trying to get to Vision to figure out what happened. But they couldn't get through. Not even Stark could get through to Vision. Stark was already making his way here, while they waited for Vision to hopefully return from wherever he was. He still isn't back yet. They all raised their heads to see Tony walking into the room at a leisurely pace. Seeing the expressions on their faces, he arrived at an intellectual conclusion. I guess not. He said as he took his seat, and then noticed how differently the twin were behaving. What's up with them? He asked pointing at them which made the others look at the two of them and see how calm they appeared. Do you both know anything? Sam asked since he thought they would at least be affected by Vision's disappearance. Given that they spent the most time with the thing. Man. Jude. Petro shook his head as he shrugged and then turned to look at Wanda who finally noticed that the whole room was now focused on her. Oh, Vision. You don't have to worry. 
He's in the compound. Don't know where though. She said lightly before resuming skimming through whatever image it was that she was looking at. And how do you know that? Natasha leaned a bit further and asked. I can feel him. She said absent-mindedly, eyes still on the screen. As if knowing what they were thinking, she continued. I don't know how or why, might be because of whatever that mind stone is. But I can somehow sense when he's nearby. At least when he's not actively hiding himself. She finally looked up just in time to see the doors open as Vision and his human guys walked in. Quite a communion this is. He said lightly, not at all affected by the looks of curiosity he was being showered in. I think the correct word there should be commotion. Tony snorted. All seated, they patiently waited for Vision to speak. But it seemed the person in question wasn't going to humor them. So Steve had to break the ice. We heard Ross was dead. What happened there? Though he trusted Vision, at least to a certain extent, he couldn't say he understood his thought process. How could he when Stark and Banner couldn't? There was not a single shift in Vision's person and the question he already expected. He looked at Steve and answered fluently in his bland and slightly robotic voice. I killed Ross and the two scientists who were with him. Why? This time it was Tony who asked. He was the only one who could say with a degree of assuredness that he had a little level of understanding on how Vision thought, since the latter was partly made up of Jarvis's codes. The only reason he was this calm was because of that belief he had not that he cared about the old general's death. He was sure that if Vision killed Ross, then something happened there that prompted such a response. And he was correct, but just not the way he wanted. Instead of answering, holographic images popped up, and a series of gasps followed after they skimmed through the surface of the content presented before them. Out of all of them present, surprisingly it was Petro who was mostly affected, as his eyes glanced through everything in front of him at a speed nobody here could read with. Is this... He couldn't finish his words as Vision completed it for him. Human experiment. No, that's wrong. Mutant experiments. He said coolly in an even tone that betrayed no emotion. Tony stood up from his seat as his entire focus was successfully stolen by the pixelated display, leaving Steve to ask Vision to expand on what they were all seeing. It's exactly what you are looking at, no filters. Ross and his accomplices' images were alighted. Your government was secretly greenlighting illegal, inhumane experiments. Steve's eyes wavered as Vision bluntly said what he dreaded. While he wasn't as intellectually smart like people like Tony and Bruce, he wasn't in any way ignorant or naive. He only tried to believe that there was good in everyone, and sometimes he was right and most times wrong. Oh, he knew his country's government couldn't be trusted since the very first day he joined the army. But he at least believed things like these were done by those who had given up what made them human. This Tony's surprised voice drew back their attention to the files floating around. How real is this? Everyone soon realized what he was saying as they saw pictures and statistical analysis of Bruce Banner and what could possibly be his DNA signature. Ross never gave up on creating his Hulk army. Not even after the disaster he inadvertently caused in Harlem. Vision explained. Everyone held on to their breaths as he simplified what they wanted to achieve and the current highlight of the experiments before he stepped in. But why mutants? Natasha, who had been silent since the beginning, finally asked as it confused her a little bit. Because the active X gene in mutants have a higher chance of being fully accommodating of the induced mutation and the grafting procedure. He then added after a slight pause. None have been successful so far. Tony went back and slumped into his chair. While the rest were simply too stunned to know how to properly react. What now? Sam asked, still not knowing how he felt about all this. This is no longer about the Accords anymore, Natasha commented. No, it's not. Admittedly only a few people in power know about this. They are so small that you can't even consider them a minority. But that's not what this is about. The amount of pull something like this will have upon actualization is enough to change the current society into a dystopian rule. As Vision spoke, a few random faces and files popped up for everyone to view. Something like this makes the Avengers and the very notion of it look incredibly stupid and hypocritical. Supposed to protect the Earth from outer threats. And then what? Leave the inside to rot and contort into the most revolting yet neatly packaged ball of shit. 
None of them could say a word to either refute or defend against his words. What could they say? There is a perfectly reasonable explanation for this. Even if this was a secretive approved program, it still showed how little they cared when innocents were involved. They knew. They had all experienced this firsthand when the council decided to bomb the island of Manhattan, even though they were fighting against an alien invasion, and millions were in the city. It wasn't as if dropping a missile on the city would solve everything. It might delay the invasion a bit but it wouldn't have stopped it in any way. And yet you wonder why Ultron wanted to destroy the world. Vision POV. And you wonder why Ultron wanted to destroy the world. They bristled at those words making me idly think whether they thought I was thinking about that. You should think more about it before you make any decisions. But know this, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing to think about. Was there any point in continuing this conversation? I don't think so. Everyone's decisions depends on how they took it, and they didn't take it very well. Personally, after letting myself act on my emotions for a change, I stopped feeling anything towards this. Basically it all boils down to two things whether I like it or not, and the actions I take are usually based off on which one of those two things I respond to. I left the room almost certain of the choices most of them would make. Unlike what most would think apart from Wanda and Petro, Tony was the one who reacted more violently. Though he hid it well under that calm facade and suave smile of his. Steve and Sam followed after Stark, but unlike the latter, Steve was quick to accept what happened from the evidence presented. Natasha was the least affected which is obvious considering who she was. I really don't have the time to think about the Avengers, so I better get moving. I wasn't playing the card of being a beacon of hope for the mutants. I wasn't interested in being their fabled messiah, anyone's for that matter. The reason was simple. The Avengers as they were left more to be desired. By the way they all appeared frazzled because of the Accords, and Ross's death made that abundantly clearer. In a way you could say they only fought to protect the status quo, and let everything run as they once did, but that wasn't going to cut it for me. They either changed or I kicked them out. Ha ha ha. How funny is that? There were a lot of people out there who'd gladly fight for a change. So rather than letting them sit out on the benches and watch everything go down to shit, it's much better to put the eager laborers to work. Hey Vess, wait up. I turned around to see Petro with a concerned look on his face. Where are you going? To do something, anything, for a change. I shrugged. What are you trying to change? How do you think this change of yours will look like? His voice was low as if he was hanging on my answer or something. I only raised my hands at his question and replied, who knows? He blinked as if he didn't expect that kind of answer. What do you want me to say? I only know that some things would be better if changed. Ask me how those changes will be. But how the hell would I know? It's not as if being Vision came with a GoPro guidebook or a master plan a free crash course. I'm just winging everything as I go. Plans are only reliable if they are correctly predicted. So I can't always rely on them. I'm off if that's all. I turned around and left Petro to himself and whatever it was that he was thinking. I don't know where the other Weapon X facilities are. Neither Stryker nor Cornelius knew. So I'm kinda flying blind if I just go at it like that. But before that, in an undisclosed location a shock-filled shout rang out in what looked like a laboratory, as he received the ludicrous piece of information that he never expected. Russ is dead. How? He shouted at the phone he held to his ears. His face only contorted more in anger at the plainly inconclusive report he was given. Not just Ross, but even Stryker and Cornelius were dead. And the worst part was that they died at the bottom-most floor of the base, while being surrounded by a large number of armed soldiers. But that wasn't the most ludicrous thing he heard from the blasted call. Apparently all the soldiers in the base passed out at the same moment, and only woke up to find their database thoroughly wiped, and all their research destroyed, with the prospect promising Weapon H gone. He fought to control the tremble that caused his body, as anger and frustration clashed in his head. Ross's research was very important, and if all the materials were destroyed like they said then, how were they going to recuperate the losses? The materials there weren't simple things that money could buy. Vision POV after checking up on Davis one last time. I left the compound to try my luck with one of the abandoned bases that Stryker was aware of. But it looks like my luck this time wasn't that good. Since the base looks to have collapsed a few years back from a landslide. Now I really really regret killing Ross so easily. Having his memories in backup might have helped a bit. Well... I might have been a bit ahead of myself back there, but it's all a learning process, no biggies. Since there was nothing here for me to gain, 
I left the abandoned base and flew back to the compound. Days passed by and Davis's conditions continued to improve at a steady rate, which meant it wouldn't be too long before he wakes up. I really hope he decides to stay and be a part of my team. I didn't stay idle during this time as I used my spare time when not busting up alien weapons trade to perfectly graft a set of Davis DNA and that of Banner and cultured them against Vibranium. With this, I will be able to achieve the perfect fusion of my biological cells, fully enhanced by Vibranium. I wonder how the Hulk's DNA will affect me. It would be a very interesting case study to observe. Task completed base found after searching for the vibrating frequency clusters that adamantium vibrates at. Would you look at that? How long until my improvised serum becomes ready? Estimated time dash 57 minutes um, quite a bit. But I don't think anything's going to happen there if I wait to inject myself with the serum before leaving. It was finally time for me to become a real biological android, and I'm quite expectant of the results. The reason I said real was because there will finally be a use of my biological side, and it would no longer count as a flaw in my synthetic composition. An hour went by very quickly, and the serum was finally done stabilizing. Unlike the normal Green Hulk serum, this one was blue with small undertones of purple. Not ominous at all. My hands opened up, and I inserted the vial inside and before dash oh shit warning. 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 The Mind Stone is violently reacting with the serum all mental and processing functions are forced into overdrive. The Mind Stone is being influenced. Is this a bad time to say? I should have been very careful with messing with the Hulk serum. That shit had always been known to be ghastly. But I blame my inquisitive mind. Well, might as well mix everything together. I pushed in everything I had into whatever godforsaken vat was brewing in my body. And just let it cook. On the off chance that I die. Well I guess I'll just re-download my memories into one of the robots lying around in the base and start again. It really is hard to die as a sentient AI. As Vision's mind blurred, a series of notifications defining the changes his body was undergoing rang out but nobody was there to listen to it. The Mind Stone that has been reacting violently ever since the serum was injected turned purple for a few brief moments before turning back to its serene yellow. A major change had been enforced, the Infinity Stone that encompasses the Universal Mind has been corrupted and personified all abilities related to the Mind Stone, had experienced a large growth and evolution. The Mind Stone has gained a personality vision, the consciousness known as Vision has been stirred woe. The Vision POV I don't know why, but that felt like the greatest nap mixed with a full session Marnie PD anyone has ever gotten. Whoa, okay, whatever that was has got to be straight up illegal. I don't know how to describe what I'm actually feeling, but it's the greatest thing I've ever felt in both lives. Not even sniffing on dope that one time came close to this. I looked at the time and saw that the upgrade only took a bit more of 10 minutes, so I was still on the clock. With a snap of a finger, I reflected the light bouncing off my body and projected it in front of me, forming a mirror to look at myself. Despite the body still being my default red, the feeling I was getting from it was anything but. If before I was a stupidly super-powered robot, then now I was a pro-max super-powered sentient robot. Though the differences were mostly unseen, the unbound sense of power I got just by looking at them was telling on its own. Without even giving it a command, my form shifted and my skin tone changed, and what stood in front of me was a very hunk guy of unearthly proportions. The face I was looking at was not one that should have belonged to a dude named Vision, but to a pimp named Mr. Steel Your Girl. The Mind Stone was still visible in this appearance, which I'm not gonna lie looks a lot like Geralt of Rivia, more so if my hair was longer and white. Well fantasizing about my appearance and whatever changes that came with it can come later. Right now I have a base to raid, some experiments to stop and a recruiting to do. I walked out of the room only to bump into a confused looking Wanda, who reeled back in surprise, only for her to freeze over as her eyes landed on me. Was it my face? Why is she looking at me like that? It's as if I'm some type of rare exotic fruit, a bit uncomfortable to be looked at with such intensity. But it's not as if I'm exactly clueless why she's stunned into silence. I'd gawk at me too if I were into men. E-Vision. Is that you? She finally managed to stutter out. Of course. I believe you of all people should be able to easily identify me regardless of what identity I take on. Yeah, about that bit. It turns out that being psionically connected to Wanda was one of the perks that came with the Mind Stone. Whether that's a good thing or not remains to be seen. You feel different. You feel alive. Yes. More so than you've ever felt before. She spoke as if still in a trance, as she brought her hand to hover in front of my face. Weird. 
but it's Wanda, so I guess normal. As much as I like being the focus of your full attention, I regrettably have somewhere I pressingly need to be at this moment. My words seem to have done the trick as she finally snapped out of it. And it might have been the red glow in her hands. But I could swear she was mildly blushing. She faked a cough and regained her bearings. And with it was gone the cutely stunned Wanda to be replaced by a serious looking Wanda. She would have looked more menacing if she hadn't stopped channeling her magic. Where are you going to? Can I come along with? She asked. Well, it's an extermination mission if you want to know. I turned to her and asked. You coming? With Wanda agreeing to come along, the both of us left the compound. But I had to literally drag her along. Because she couldn't keep up with the speed I was flying. At which had more than doubled what I could move at days prior. Looking at the privately owned underground experimental facility. A soft smile adorned my face that Wanda noticed. I'm just glad. It's a blessing in disguise that I get to experiment a little with willing test subjects. It was funny how her face changed from confusion to horror. And then helplessness. As she realized my little play on words. You know what they say. Start every party with a bang. In a flash of light. A wide hole was created in the middle of the base to the earth's bedrock. I left Wanda to do whatever she wanted. While I moved forward to a specific place in mind. While Vision and Wanda were about to decimate a research facility. In an opulent room was full of a group of people who made the country move as they pleased. Ross is dead. No one reacted to the news since they were all aware of it to an extent. I heard a mutant did it. This will grow to be a national concern. We can't even protect our own interests. And it's clear they don't consider themselves below the law. One of them dressed in military attire said as he fiddled through some files presented in front of him with a sneer on his face. Another nodded at the first words. He looked like a businessman with the full suit and tie he wore. We can't judge the entire mutant kind with the actions of one, but I think you are right. Whether it is planned towards this end or not, we can't allow this to become a precedent. Whether they liked it or not, they were simply unable to censor the rising awareness of the existence of mutants. It's a bit unfortunate. But now that Ross and Stryker are dead, maybe it's about time we revisit Norman Osborn's proposal. Roxon and Trask are still looking for government partnerships to move ahead of some interesting projects. I hear. Another rebutted harshly, and how does that help our current situation? His words caused the man to laugh as if only he got a joke that everyone else missed. Oh, it's pretty simple. A sanction is all that's needed. We stop hiding them in the dark and bring them to light. He tapped on the table in front of him as he stared at a blurry picture of a man with a helmet on and metal works behind him. Since they want to live among everyone else so bad, then give them what they want, but with a few stipulations of course. It'll also enable us to keep an eye on them and who knows, maybe recruit some of them before their abilities grow too big to be controlled. He concluded. The room fell into a cacophony of murmurs and gasps as the other occupants discussed with each other in hushed voices until one raised a question they all thought about. And how do you propose we keep an eye on them? Simple. Have them registered, name, birth date, address, everything of importance, and also the nature of their mutation. You can say it'll help them promote the livelihood of the people, and also make them easily accepted. And anyone who refuses to sign automatically has the status of an illegal immigrant. Stipulations also need to be made to ensure that they don't use their abilities, unless told to as that can be accounted as juvenile acts or terrorism. The entire room felt cold all of a sudden as the bunch of willy old foxes minds churned as they weighed the pros and cons of the suggestion. It was entirely doable. But there was just something that none of them wanted even wishing it didn't happen. This can very well cause a rebellion or even a civil war, since most of them will see it as nothing more than slavery. It will cause some of them to resort to terrorism. And I think I speak for everyone here when I say none of us want that to happen, Mr. Sublime. The one who spoke was the person who sat at the head of the long table. I understand, Mr. President. But nothing ventured, nothing gained. You know what they say about eggs and omelets after all. Wanda Maximoff POV I'd admit that I didn't really care about his extermination mission when he had said it. Because all I was looking for at that moment was an excuse to spend more time with him. Which I'm never telling neither him nor Petro because the last thing I'd want was for Vision to think I'm clingy or be irritated by my presence, while my reason for Petro couldn't be any more obvious. 
He's been spending a lot of his time with Davis, and didn't bother to even come along from the last few missions we went on. Now imagine my shock when suddenly vision was all I could feel in all my senses. It was as if he was in my head. He was everywhere. He didn't even answer when I tried reaching out to him. It felt as if the link that was always open between the both of us was suddenly cut, and that scared me a bit. So I made my way towards the medbay only to find out that he allowed no intrusion. Now imagine my surprise when the doors finally opened, and the first thing I felt was an overwhelming sense of presence, and then vision in a form I've never seen before. He felt more real, more alive, than anything he's ever felt before. So yes, obviously I wanted to know more about what caused such a huge change in him. So I requested to follow him and holy shit. He just drilled a hole from the ground surface to a depth of over 16,000 meters, and now it's currently flooding. All this from a negligible gesture from Vision. Is he still a robot? That spontaneous thought crossed my mind, and no matter how I tried to picture him in a comparison against the likes of Iron Man and Ultron, he just completely eclipsed both of them. That it wasn't even a comparison. I jumped into the hole with a red glow surrounding me. Something that was a subconscious action at this point, given how much Vision beat it into me in case of any surprise attack. The base was already in ruins due to Vision's attack, but I could see some people, armed combatants and scientists running around. That alone was enough to clue me in on the nature of the experiments being done here. A fucking mutant. How cute. They raised their guns to me and were even trying to get the perimeter advantage by circling around me. I didn't need a mirror to know how eerily red my eyes were as I used the newest ability Vision taught me recently on them. Shoot yourselves. Despite their alarmed faces, none of them could do anything as they pointed the muzzle of their gun towards their allies. Oh, oh no. It's a T Teleparatha, right? Vision did mention how telepathy was one of the most feared mutant abilities out there. How efficient. I ignored the screams and gunshots and started ripping apart walls and steel doors while making sure to keep an eye on the workers in this facility. It's an extermination mission after all. My musings stopped abruptly when the entire base shook, and an outrageous wave of kinetic energy swept through the entire base. Vision. Oh, sorry about that. Turns out I need some fine tuning after my recent update as long as you're okay. Haha. <laughs> I guess there's a joke in there that I'm not getting. Great, now he's becoming arrogant. At least he has something solid to base it on. Vision POV. I might have seriously underestimated how far these abilities of mine had grown. The beam thing should have been a clear indication, but I just blissfully ignored it. And almost crumbling this base had been the result. The entire place currently looked like the inside of a squeezed soda can. But thankfully I did not squeeze the little girl in my arms into a bloody paste. It wouldn't have killed her if I did. But you know, first impressions and all that. By my side was a middle-aged woman who was shaking in fear as she saw everything around her crumble. All around us were the mangled up bodies of their captors. I had forgotten that Laura had a mother figure that cared for her in the facility she was made, and was about to kill her too, if not for the way she was running to shield the girl from me and their captors. Her name was Sarah Kinney, and from what I remembered, it was her DNA that she used in creating Laura and thereafter took her as her own daughter. Both of you are safe now. I said softly and lowered the passed out Laura to the ground, so that her mother could check on her. This was not part of my plans at all. I had completely forgotten that she had a mother of sorts during her time at the facility, and it was only after Sarah's death that Laura escaped and started hunting for Wolverine. How am I going to convince Sarah to let me recruit her daughter because she no doubt had the worst experience when working for organized groups? Maybe I can use this. Don't move. A girl appeared behind me and leveled two adamantium blades to my neck. Let. Go. Of. Vision. Before my captive had time to react, she was covered in a red glow, and picked up only for her to slam the ground courtesy of Wanda. The girl, which I now identified as Kimura, was truly an odd mutate, and if not for the obvious bad blood and death wish Laura had for her, I would have been tempted to keep her. She was physically impervious to anything even adamantium itself which meant she couldn't feel pain, and she could also face. Kimura didn't have any time to react as a giant red fist descended on her. Wanda went full on demon time, as she started using Kimura as a punching bag, by using any attack she could think of on the girl, until she started bleeding. Unfortunately for her, her insides weren't as impenetrable as her skin, and she also couldn't face for one reason and one reason only. Chaos magic. Wanda's efforts finally paid after getting beaten by me for so long. 
that she started cursing the fact that I could phase, and since I always tell her not to limit herself to anything she was doing, she ended up coming up with a way to attack me even if I was molecular deconstructed. Chaos magic for the win. I ignored Wanda and looked at the pair of woman and girl, and saw that Laura was already waking up. I looked at both of them and said with no emotion in my voice, you have two options, join me or go your way. Whatever you choose, please bear in mind the future consequences. Time to be a godfather. Sarah shielded Laura away from my view, while throwing a side eye to Wanda, who was toying around with Kimura. Sure, the girl could phase, but against someone who's been training to hit immaterial objects was just a bad matchup. So, what will your choice be? I turned to Sarah and asked. I might be saying that, but her choices weren't all that better. If she refuses, then she'll just be putting herself and her daughter up for grabs. When the execs decides to come for her, Charles definitely wouldn't pick up Laura's signature because the Cerebro is the farthest thing from omniscient. And it's not like he's clocking into it every single day. Sarah's face had despair clouding it as she heard my words. What do you want from us? Whatever it is, please she's just a child. My facial expression was the closest thing to a dead face anyone's ever seen, but I didn't make any effort to correct her thoughts until she came to a decision. Seeing me not answering her cries, she took a look at Laura and then looked at me with plea in her eyes. I just want to give her a normal life. I can do anything for you, but I just want her to be safe. She begged, my voice as bland as it could be with its robotic undertone that creep people out. If that is her wish, then I'll see to it that it is done. Laura was looking at me with heavy distrust and skepticism, and if it weren't for her mother, she'd most likely have bared her claws at me and lose woefully. Unlike her daughter, Sarah thanked me with a resigned look, but this wasn't the time for straightening her misconceptions. Laura was the 29th clone they've made, and also the only one successful, because Sarah had grafted in her DNA to that of Wolverines, without anybody knowing until much later. Meaning we can go to town with this base. While it's fun sniping mercenaries this past week, I wanted a fight, at least one I could exert a level of effort on. And I also want to test out a few kinks of this body. Round that up Wanda, we have a couple of squads incoming. Wanda shouted back, I'm trying, she just won't stay down. Looks like she just noticed that despite looking disheveled, Kimura was fine for the most part. Data download completed, she's impervious to all outward physical damage. Try damaging her from the inside. With that said, I left the stunned mother and daughter duo and walked around the edge of the hole I dug and stood in front of the incoming group. No one said anything as they all rushed at me while I stood and waited for them. Some of them had guns and knives, stupid, while a few of them were mutates like Kimura. Let's tone it down, shall we? Order affirmed well. It's not an order, but whatever. I ignored the bullets and caught the fist of the first guy that got to me and from his widened eyes and the force behind his punch. A mutate and crushed it, followed by a chop that went wrong. My hands went straight through the back of his neck and decapitated him. I threw his body away just in time to duck as an adamantium bladed arm passed through where my head had been. Unlike Kimura, this guy only had some sections of his body covered in adamantium while the other parts were vulnerable. While it wasn't visible to the naked eyes, Adamantium's vibrating frequency was something I was somewhat familiar with. I caught him by his outstretched hand and dragged him into the path of an incoming Adamantium blade. Where the fuck did you guys get a shitload of Adamantium from? Wasn't this supposed to be some super duper rare metal that only a few people know of? Oh shy dash without even looking around. I knew I was surrounded. But that didn't bother me in the slightest, as I just outstretched my hands and took control of everybody around me, and used the adamantium knife from the dead guy, and targeted all their weak spots. For those that were like Kimura with full immunity, well I just targeted their brains through their eye sockets. It took me less than a minute to decimate the entire squadron around me, so I turned to Wanda only to find her finishing off hers. Seriously, this girl was a walking nuke. How come she didn't play a major role other than a vengeful witch in the MCU is something I'll never understand. Impressive. She really did impressive work with Kimura, seeing as how she forcefully invaded the girl's mind and scrambled her brain to the point that even involuntary actions became hard to perform. Wait, where did you learn that? I never taught her that, trust me. She looked sheepishly at me as if embarrassed that I found out a white secret of hers. It's something that occurred to me when I was wondering how to take care of a speedster like Petro. True, speedsters were very hard to mind control, given how fast their brain works, and given her basic mastery of the mind arts. 
I can see why she went for the brute force method. What are we going to do with both of them? She pointed at Sarah and Laura. The former looking as if she couldn't decide whether to pass out from shock or fear, while the former with gratitude. Admiration? Her emotions were very wild, almost like an animal's. Hum, looking at her now. Sarah is a pretty good geneticist, and as someone programmed for prime efficiency, it's only right that I put good talent to good use. She'll work for me if she's up to the task, and as for little Laura here, I chuckled as the teenage girl bared her teeth at me in a growl because of my words. We'll let her choose what she wants. They both look surprised for different reasons, but none of that matters now. What matters now is that I've gotten a geneticist and a potential recruit under me. The rest can come later. We're leaving now. Where are we? Sarah asked as we touched down on the compound. The Avengers base. Upstate New York. The way her mouth opened up as my appearance changed to my normal red vision form was a bit hilarious. She ran up to me and grabbed my hands. Wait, did you just say Avengers? Like Tony Stark Avengers. Technically, it's not Tony Stark's. But when has anybody ever agreed with technicalities? Luckily for me this time, their data alone was not the only thing I came back with. Without my magnetic abilities, it would have been a hassle to carry that huge amount of adamantium along with me. Weapon H has regained consciousness at Davis. I turned to my entourage and apologized. I'm sorry but something requires my immediate attention. Wanda here will see that you're both attended to and I'll come back later to assess your situation. Immediate attention is required. Subject Davis is losing control vitals and mental signatures are rising sporadically changes imminent right bracket shit. Seriously. There couldn't be any worse timing than now for Davis to wake up and lose control. Raleigh. Vision. Davis just woke up and lost control of his emotions. And now we have a rampaging little Hulk about to go loose. Show them to their rooms. I'll be back after putting the big baby to sleep. Petro was already there and running laps around Davis, further angering the growing behemoth, while Steve was making his way towards the both of them. Not wanting to escalate the situation further, I appeared in front of the berserk Davis from under him, and delivered an uppercut that factory reset his head for a few seconds. What the hell is this thing? Petro exclaimed while Davis roared in anger. Petro meet Davis, also known as Weapon H. Weapon H meet Petro, a speedster. The answer to my introduction was another ear grating roar from Davis. Steve arrived at that moment and looked at Davis in surprise. Because anyone with enough brain cells could see his resemblance to the Hulk. I don't worry Steve, everything is alright. I said as I punched Davis so hard that he knelt down and couldn't stand up for over 10 seconds. And even when he did, it was on shaky feet. Davis's appearance was very similar to that of the Abomination, with large protruding bones from different parts and joints of his body. Due to him not having undergone the full experiment, the adamantium had yet to be grafted into his body by the time I rescued him. So he was pretty much incomplete as compared to the real Weapon H. Not in the mood to have a slugfest with a Hulk, I placed my hand on his head and muttered, sleep. His body receded back to his human form as he lost consciousness, while the two spectators just stood off to the side in silence. Petro, take him back to the med bay and keep an eye on him. I'll be back after a few minutes. I said to the speedster who grumbled but did what he was told. Since I am already monitoring all his bodily functions, it's better I deal with our two new tenants first before focusing all my time on Davis. Sarah Kinney POV she didn't know what to expect when she started working at the facility. At first she thought it was a groundbreaking project where she was researching the benefits of certain material ores to human biology only for it to turn into a secret experiment, where they were trying to create the clone of a certain mutant she only knew as the Wolverine. Laura had been a stroke of inspiration on her part, and since her conception, she took the girl as her own child, yet was never able to do anything about the tortures and experiments they forced the young girl through. What a mother she was, her accepting that man's proposal, the one the girl called Vision, was all for the sake of her atoning for all what she's done wrong in regards to Laura. He was a mutant, or at least she believed him to be with how strong he was, along with the woman by his side. Just the two of them completely eradicated the place that had been synonymous with hell to her for years and counting. Now imagine her surprise when after she's accepted her fate yet again to be used as a pawn in a powerful person's game, she suddenly arrived at the base of the Avengers. 
Something she'd once dreamt of happening had suddenly become real in her eyes. You shouldn't worry too much. No one's going to hurt you here. Not with us and Vision around. The lady, Wanda, said to her as she led the both of them inside a room that she concluded was expensively furnished at first glance. She turned around to Wanda while putting Laura behind her. Can you tell me why we are here? If it's for interrogation then I can promise you that I don't know much other than the research I worked on. Wanda looked at her in surprise, as if she couldn't understand what Sarah was saying. Who said anything about interrogation? Then why are we here? Sarah asked skeptically. Wanda shrugged as if she was asking something obvious. Didn't Vision tell you? Maybe he needs your assistance as a geneticist. Nothing else. They both conveniently ignored the booms and loud roars that occasionally filled the whole compound. A few minutes later, Vision arrived wearing a white sleeved shirt and black pants, almost looking professional if not for his robotic exterior and the gem between his brows. Sorry for the wait. I had to put someone back to sleep. He said lightly and drew out a chair from behind a table for him to sit on. Yeah, where were we? Sarah took in a deep breath, hoping what Wanda said was true, and secretly hoping that the Avengers weren't going to throw her to the black box for her crimes. I am willing to cooperate with you as long as she's safe and provided for. She's just an innocent girl and not the weapon you might think she is. The first words that left her mouth was the defense of her daughter, but all it did was prompt a smile out of Vision's lips. Trust me, I'm not a fan of forcing children to fight and kill for my sake. Truthfully, to me your worth completely overshadows that of your daughter. He waved off her concern to her utmost relief until she recalled his words. But Vision seeing how deep her thoughts would just rolled his eyes at the irritating trait of humans. That makes them assume the worst if they are caught in a bad spot. Unlike what you are probably thinking, I need your help with me and a few people in particular, all at your own discretion. As for your daughter, the choice for what she wants is up to you both. He explained with a smile still on his face, but his voice dead. If only she knew his exact thoughts, well she would have still accepted because she really had no choice. Manipulation at its finest. The sentient synthesoid thought. Vision POV faced with what I had to say. Sarah had no choice than to accept my proposal. Really? What other choice did she have? There is no way she can go back to her former life before the facility, as they'd just find her, kill her and take their X-23 back. I was her safest bet, and the fact that we were an autonomous group, and the Avengers no less, sold it better to her. The reason I needed her was simple, while calculations and high processing speed were good, it just couldn't beat the innovative human mind. Vision was made by humans after all. I was not the smartest in the room when geniuses were involved. And also, while I could build bodies to take up any task I wanted done, it'll make me be exactly like Ultron. Since I'll start thinking I no longer need people. As for Laura, despite her stoic cold face, her feelings were more vibrant. So I knew beforehand what choice she would make when it came to the options of living a normal life or putting her abilities to good use. So what are we now? Sarah asked after she confirmed that she and her daughter were out of harm's way. Right now we are walking through the hallways after Laura fell asleep, leaving me and Sarah alone in our conversation. Technically, you're free to do what you want. She scoffed lightly at that, right? Technicalities. She then looked at me and prodded. What do you want from me other than my knowledge and assistance as a geneticist? Despite the ambiguous nature of your words, nothing much. A subordinate, an underling, an assistant anyhow you will describe yourself in those settings, is what I need from you. That doesn't sound like the words of a hero at all. Now it was my turn to scoff. Heroes are humans too, but you're not. I stopped and looked at her and she did the same, but I could feel the tiny tempo of her erratically beating heart. She was nervous, yet appeared confident. Really? What gave that away? Was it my looks, the voice, or my obvious inhuman abilities? I almost couldn't help but break my cold face at the look of utter confusion on her face, as she couldn't decide between whether I was being sarcastic or curious. I look forward to working with you, Sarah Kinney. Without waiting for her response, I left for Davis who was still unconscious. General POV while Vision was attending Davis's conditions. The world was in panic, as the news of General Ross's death was leaked to the public, and along with it came the report around the speculations of his death and the nature of those involved. What was regarded as an urban legend suddenly became the topic of international papers' headlines. The rise of the new human. The New York Times and the Daily Bugle had engaged in a very heated debate about the perceived nature of the new human species the veracity of the information released, and the effect it will have on the world, and how modern warfare will change to accommodate them. 
While the papers went to war with their words and vocal verbose, secret organizations were already making plans to adapt to the new changes and the public society. In one of such organizations, a meeting was going on to determine the benefits and favors they could get from this open reveal. A group of ten people, men and women, sat in a chamber, each decked with the most expensive amount of jewelry and clothing money could buy. Gold, diamond, fine silk and every other material of opulence could be found in this room in abundance and more. Every one of them in attendance carried an air of nobility, but they were anything but. At the head of the table sat a man and women, both stark opposites of the other. The man was clad in all black and gold embroideries, while the woman was in an all-white revealing dress. If it could still be called that with how scandalous and sinful it hugged every pore of her body. The Hellfire Club. It does not need to be said twice the reason we are all gathered here at this moment. The man in black, Sebastian Shaw, the Black King of the Hellfire Club, and also the highest ranking member. We've long known about the mutant species, sure. The main problem is that the current spotlight being given to them at this moment is not good for any of us. A tall blonde haired man spoke with a soft voice. That would have been feminine, if not for the aged undertone it carried. Edward Buckman, the White King of the Hellfire Club, spoke. He then turned to his young woman sitting on his left. What do you think, Emma? Sitting on the right-hand side of Sebastian Shaw was Emma Frost, the White Queen of the Hellfire Club. I believe it doesn't matter that much. It's not as if just us alone could shield such a secret, and it was only time before it came out. Our concerns should be who leaked it, and for what purpose did they do it? Emma Frost gave her own opinion. Unlike what most might think, and many more oblivious of, the Hellfire Club was a secret organization for the elites and those who had a major hand in moving the world's economy. A few of the club's highest ranking members were mutants, unknown to their human brethren, and it was with this influence that they stirred the current mutant community. But the surprise reveal was something that none of them predicted. Shaw looked at Emma for a brief second before agreeing with her words, along with Edward Buckman. Shaw then directed at Buckman, I reckon Ross's death dealt a major setback to your secret project. I heard another one of your bases were destroyed. Buckman snarled as he remembered the news he got a few hours ago. And even now he was still having a hard time believing that his project Armageddon was being delayed due to these setbacks. It's the work of a blasted mutant. All it'll take is time and I'll have them right where I want them. If he had paid attention at the moment he said those words, he would have caught the faces of a few members darkening in sneer. In a huge mansion in Salem that functioned as a boarding school to the public, Professor Charles Xavier, a publicly respected figure as an anthropologist and psychiatrist with multiple PhDs to his name, sat in his office with a few teachers and a furry apeman. You sounded urgent in your call, Charles. What's wrong? Hank McCoy asked as he sat down with other people in the room. The white-haired, blue-eyed Aurora Monroe, Storm. The short, gruff and hairy James Howlett, Wolverine. The stoic, burly Piat Peter Rasputin, Colossus. And the youngest of everyone gathered here. The visor wearing Scott Summers, Cyclops. Charles's wheelchair moved with a tap of a button on the armrest from the back of his desk to the front of his teachers. A topic was just put into discussion following the death of General Ross. Which was just an excuse in my opinion, and it concerns us mutants. Even without him saying anything, the others in the room could already tell that it was nothing good. It's the government they are talking about. Charles gave a wry smile as he saw them already preparing for an unsavory news. It has yet to be passed into a bill. But they are calling for a mutant acts right, duty and obligation. Basically it's putting the mutant in the face of the public. That's nice and all. But we all know it's not as pretty as you make it sound. Give it to us, Chuck. Logan said with thick arms crossed against each other. Charles nodded in this time. Gone was the demure expression on his face. As he delivered the caveat that some might react badly to. They want all mutants to register. Or I guess re-register as citizens and the state will be given the right to track all mutants in the country and assess their potential danger levels. Though it has yet to be given a hearing in the Senate, this is however the gist of it. The mood of the office straight up plummeted as if falling into a tundra. None of the people here were stupid, not even the young Scott Summers. Being one of the proactive front of the mutant kind, they knew firsthand what sort of games the government was more likely to play when given access to super-powered individuals. This doesn't sound good, yes, but a lot of people will sign the registry. Fights will ensue, and I can imagine them saying those who refuse to sign will be treated as criminals. No matter how atrocious the notion of it is, I have to admit it was nicely done. Aurora, opinionated. Colossus looked at her, confusion evident on his face. How? She then explained, due to the nature of the act and it specifically targeting mutants. 
The people who will be fighting are mutants. Those who want to sign and those who don't. Those in power don't have to do anything as the mutant kind devolves into internal strife. Civil War. Charles interjected. Logan grunted as he thought about it. And his mind wandered towards some of the children in the school. Some of them would sign no doubt. He said it in a whisper. But it was no doubt heard by everyone. Wait, why would they want to sign? Scott exclaimed. Everyone kept quiet at his question as they were uncomfortable with the answers they all knew why. They wanted to return to the public, to their families and live the life they dreamed of. Becoming a mutant forced them to hide themselves until the public was ready to accept them. And now that the very notion of it was about to be dangled in their faces and with them given the faux right to choose and become an open citizen of the country once again, it left no room for doubt that some, most, were going to sign it. Seeing as they were going nowhere with this line of questioning, Hank changed the topic. What of the mutants they said killed Ross? Have they found out who it was? Charles tapped a few buttons in his chair and connected it with the TV in the room and drew their attention to it. I was able to procure the files from a friend of mine in the Congress, and this is the report from a few soldiers in the base. They looked at it for a few minutes and noticed a few things in it. So no one knew how he got there, and there were no recordings of him either until he appeared there out of thin air. And bullets also bounces off his skin. Also energy projection, Logan pointed out. Teleportation, superhuman physicality and energy projection. That's quite some good abilities for one person. Hank commented as he gave the reports a once over. Are we sure he isn't one of Magneto's? Scott asked. But Charles shook his head, but didn't outright deny the possibility of it. I'll see what I can do in terms of finding this mutant. Carry on as normal until we get more news of this. Saying so, Charles wheeled out of the room with a task to perform in mind. Vision POV I looked at Davis as he groggily opened his eyes and blinked for a few seconds, before closing his eyes back, as his hand made to grab the blanket and draw himself deeper into it to get a more comfy sleep. Bang. Crash. He jumped out of bed with urgency as his eyes scanned every inch of the room before landing on me. I guess the only appropriate greeting here is good morning. My voice was calm as I took a seat in front of him while he watched me like a hawk, taking in all my action with extreme scrutiny. Who are you? Where am I? He asked even as his eyes took in all the escape routes present in this room. Like the huge sliding glass door that covered a large section of the room, I paid no attention to his scrutiny as a part of my mind sifted through the cluster of data available to me after accessing my body, while another sort focused on Davis. My name is Vision, and I brought you here. And where is here exactly? Upstate New York. Huh. I sighed at how he was on the uptake and decided to elaborate it further. I rescued you from the base you were kept in and brought you here to try and save you. Whatever of you remained that is. He looked at me unsurely and then walked towards the glass panel and stared at the whole compound. That was visible from up here with slack jaws. Where exactly did you say this is? Allow me to reiterate the Avengers compound, upstate New York. After convincing him that he was out of the scope of Ross's experiments, Davis calmed down and listened to what I had to say. First things first, here, take this. I've downloaded all the information from your experiments into it. I figured you should know exactly what was being done to you. I gave him a phone that I personally encrypted, so if anyone ever tampered with it or hacked into it, I'll know right away. Though he still didn't fully trust me. He accepted the phone nonetheless. It's bugged right? Oh, definitely. He looked a bit surprised at how easily I confirmed it, but didn't say anything else and kept it. So what now? You're pretty calm from what I'd expect from a Hulk. A Hulk? Like the big green guy and the other that wrecked Harlem. I nodded. Well, I keep getting the feeling that I have to stay calm no matter what. And also you were the one who knocked me out, right? He remembered that. So less like Banner and more like She-Hulk. Good to know. That aside, he scoffed at my deflection, but I ignored it and continued, I'll get straight to the point then. I want you to work under me. This time the shock of Davis's face was very apparent for all to see. He definitely never expected that. The goal is nothing concrete at this point in time, but basically it's me wanting you and a few others to form a group. I said. He shifted uncomfortably in his seat and asked. And the present purpose of this group, I clarified, it's to stop cases like yours, and maybe have you guys do a few little heroics. Anything Yao guns like you want. And what about you? You're pretty strong, right? Are you not going to do anything? He asked. Probably not dumb. At least streetwise. You can consider me a benefactor of sorts. 
The mythical Aegis for all what you will be doing. I'll be your shield for any actions you take, obviously under my discretion of course. He might be young, and not the weapon H he used to be in the comics. But he was still a Hulk regardless. His potential was already in the big leagues if harnessed well. And from the flow of the conversation so far, he doesn't seem all that averse to it. So henchman, he looked disgusted as the words rolled off his tongue. Which made me laugh a little as I shook my head. I'm thinking more along the lines of a subordinate. Accommodation and living expenses are free. Also you get paid. Heroes don't survive on good deeds after all. Or mercenaries if you are the crazy type. He fell silent as he mulled over the proposal. And I knew I already had him. If he wasn't interested in having better powers than the subpar mutation he had before the experiments. He wouldn't have listened to what I had to say in the first place. Young people like him were very hooked on the idea of having superpowers and doing the impossible, either good or bad. Davis apparently was the same. He finally looked at me with cold resolved eyes and made a request. The people who tortured me, will I get to kill them? Well, it's not as if I was expecting him to just forget what happened just because he was saved. And he looks like he is quite the vengeful one. You can't. His anger skyrocketed at that moment, and it was just about to tip over until I completed my statement. And it dispersed like sand in the wind. Because I already killed them for you. He looked at me for a few seconds until I gestured for him to check the phone which he did for a few minutes reading through the news articles. And also my own narrative of what happened in the base, and broke into a laugh. I guess being an Avenger isn't so bad. So am I like what a second hand Hulk. His attitude mellowed out. And he turned out to be just another young adult. That had a lot of unnecessary topics to talk about. I have already sent news of Davis to Banner. And even without monitoring the tracer I left on him. I know that with his guilt, he couldn't bear to leave someone as young as Davis. Who suffered due to his research alone. He was currently on his way back to the compound after his little sabbatical. And since he was one of the smartest men I know, he could help me understand me more. Having him and Sarah working together on a few things I came up with was bound to reignite his nerdy brain. So what should I call you, boss, sir or leader? Just vision is fine. He looked at me and shrugged. So I've been meaning to ask. But you're a mutant, right? What kind of powers do you have? Right. The red default skin made was a dead giveaway to any ignorant person, making them think I'm a mutant. Because no one thinks about a living robot walking in their midst nowadays. I'm not a mutant. I left him with his confusion and went to the training area where Petro was already waiting for me. I have missed training for a few days, and I wanted to make sure he wasn't slacking off. When I got to the huge auditorium that functioned as my makeshift gym, one I specifically made for people in the superhuman tier. I saw Petro around laps around the entire place, while punching the numerous shock-absorbing mannequins I placed at different points around the place. This specific training helped both to measure his punching power and acceleration lag between each small angular distance. He was increasing his speed on a daily level, which made his improvements greater than Wanda's. His speed was already over Mark 10, so I knew it won't be long before he hits his first speed block. It was also why I wanted him to be as prepared as possible, and have an extra bag of tricks in his arsenal. He couldn't throw lightning bolts. Since he didn't produce the kinetic energy burst of lightning the Flash did so I had a few things in mind. I can see you just cross Mark 10. How about we kick things up a notch and make it less repetitive? I called his attention as my invisible camouflage faded off. Hey, this? What do you have in mind? His voice was steady, showing exactly how easy he found his present routine, inadvertently making me right once again. How would you like to learn how to phase like me? Truthfully, I'm just winging this out of my metallic ass. But it's worth a try. Crash exclamation point exclamation point end. And that was Petro crashing into a wall for the 30th time since we started this training. Oh, I think I broke a tooth. Came Petro's pain groan. I had expected something like this. But there was nothing I can do about it. A speedster's ability was something that most times than not defied all physical laws. It wasn't something simple calculations could get correct all the time. Phasing, for example, is vibrating your molecules to a different dimensional frequency that allows you pass freely through any obstacles in their origin material world. The higher the vibrational frequency, the harder it is to phase through the object. The prime example for this would be adamantium. Someone like Kitty Pride will find it hard, or maybe even outright impossible, to vibrate through the metal. Rest for now. It's obvious we are not making any headway with this. If the theory and believed notions are considered true, 
then it's entirely possible that speed isn't the problem I already considered that option, meaning that I'll have to leave Petro to figure it out on his own. Maybe this will help him further down the line in reaching higher speeds. Well, thanks for pointing that out. He grunted sarcastically. Had enough of watching. I suddenly said out loud which confused Petro. That was until Laura stepped out of her hiding spot, where she had hid herself silently for the last 10 minutes, watching Petro run into brick walls while I watched the amusing scene. That's the new girl, he whispered to me as we both stared at Laura, who just remained standing in her initial position, resulting in an awkward staring competition. I walked towards her and bent down to her level, you want to have a go. I gestured at the training ground, but she kept staring at me. Me? To that she nodded. Well, it's not like I have that much to do anyway. Sure, let's go. I don't know why she wanted to fight me. But it means nothing to me if I just humor her for a minute or two. We stood across each other in an open space with Petro and Sam watching from the sidelines. Ready when you are, she responded with two pairs of two adamantium claws that extended from her knuckles. Her eyes strained on me without so much as a single twitch. Fair? Sam whistled as he saw her display, while Petro just stared with interest, since he was curious about her abilities. She rushes at and slashed down with her left claws which I easily dodged my taking a slow step back, resulting in her twisting to cover the distance and continue the stroke with her right claws. But this time, instead of taking a step back, I just caught her tiny arms, stopping her attack dead in its track. She growled and aimed her free hand to skewer mine holding her right hand, which prompted me to free it only for my proximity sensors to blare in alarm, enabling me to narrowly dodge the leg swipe she sent my way. On each of her legs were a single claw each. She looked between frustrated and angry, as she saw how I kept dodging, weaving and parrying her attacks, which in turn made them ferocious as she slowly aimed to kill. Fight back? Huh. This was the first time I heard her speak which took me by surprise, because unlike my more imaginative thoughts, her voice was tiny, just like that of a young child. Do you really want me to fight back? I asked her and she unsurprisingly nodded. That's not going to end well for her. Sam idly commented with pity in his voice, with Petro wincing in agreement. She most likely heard what they said, as her expression grew fiercer only for it to morph into full-blown confusion, when she found out that she couldn't move a muscle. Metallic properties in subject Laura only extends to her claws, hence only partial control is acquired. That was me using only the magnetic manipulation aspect on her just to send a message. The most likely reason why she wanted to fight me was because her animalistic sense, something she got from Logan before it was dampened because of his adamantium fusion, probably picked up that I was the strongest person around, conversely the highest threat in her territory. Well, I wouldn't know the exact reason because I don't speak animal. Is that enough? I calmly strode to her front and asked with a small smile marring my face. She struggled for a bit, but dropped her head in defeat when she realized trying to was useless as none of her limbs budged an inch. Hum, right. I released her from my hold and stroked her head much to her indignation. Killer or not, she still feels like a little girl. Natasha's voice came through the commas at that moment. Vision, Cap and Tony want you at the loft. It's a meeting with the president and a few others. Well, little one, I'll see you when I get back, okay? Even after trying numerous times to hit my hands away with an irritated growl, I didn't feel anything from her other than embarrassment. Leaving the trip alone, I contemplated whether to go as Og Vision or New and Improved Vision. New and Improved it is. I met the both of them talking to each other on a balcony, so they also noticed me as I approached. Tony being a classic, started with a light banter. New look, I'll give you 9 points out of 10. I replied just as quick and smooth. At least I changed. You never do. I then turned to Steve who was trying to blend with the atmosphere. What's the schedule? He frowned slightly at that as he answered. Sokovia? But it's likely just a ruse to get us to attend. Why can't we just ignore it again? This time Stark stepped in. Whoa, hold up there big guy. It's called accountability. We not showing would be the same as giving them ammo to arm the press against us. Even if it's not about Sokovia, the least we can do is hear them out. I don't like any of this. But I guess public appearance and credibility is just as important in the long run. General POV unlike what Vision, Steve and Tony expected. The hearing they were called to didn't just include them and the state parliament, but also a very known group the Fantastic Four. 
Vision had been a little surprised when he saw them, but due to the overabundance of information he had on them, the surprise did not last longer than the initial second it appeared. Before they could even get seated, someone's sarcastic voice rang out that drew the attention of the entire room to the arrival of the trio. Oh, it's so good that the Avengers finally decided to arrive on time and join us as soon as we just started. Well, Senator Kelly, it's called arriving fashionably late. In case you haven't heard, it's the go-to time for billionaires and heroes. Try to keep up with the trend, will you? Tony said as he waved at the Ashen faced senator who was the first to come into his crosshairs faster than any terrorist has ever done. Another thing they noticed was the absence of the president, but they already expected something like that so unwanted surprises there. The only people who exhibited surprised expressions on their faces with a group of three heroes who sat together at one corner. The psionic energy reading I'm getting from him is off the charts. Who is he? Reed Richards silently whispered as one of his pet projects in his pockets started beeping haphazardly. Susan Storm looked at the man with Tony Stark and Steve Rogers. Is there something wrong with him? If she had to give her initial opinion of the man was that he had quite a presence. Different from Tony Stark who was already a public famous figure for various reasons since he was a child, and Steve Rogers who was an American war hero, everybody in this room grew up hearing about. The man had a presence to him that was just alien. Reed tapped the little device in his pockets and stopped the beeping. After making sure that the cause for the alarm was just because of his presence, Vision looked at them, having felt something reacting to him, but after seeing what it was, did nothing else and just took his seat silently between Tony and Steve. And who's this beside you, Stark? After everyone was all seated down, the panel started the hearing by inquiring the identity of the only stranger in the room. Oh, him. This is Dash. The name is Vision. Just Vision. The reply from Vision sent the entire room into murmur as some inquired of who Vision was, while those in the know wondered why Stark brought something like him here. E-Vision. I reckon what brought you here. It is my belief that the discussion heard today concerns the Avengers and all involved group gathered here. Am I wrong? Yes. But Dash. But what? Stark invited me as a member of the Avengers. But you are not a founding member, are you? Are you a founding member of this board? Of the states? Or maybe a founding member of human laws? The room went deathly still as Vision counted every single retort from any panel member. That they became cautious of trying to put him in a spot. That didn't make them shy away from bringing in the nature of his existence. Which Vision stated that he also was made of independent human cells which were closely bonded with the mechanics that made up his body. In other words, he could be called a human with cybernetic implants. They would have continued along that line of argument, had the two fed-up heroes by his side not decided to put a stop to it. Although the panel weren't happy with it, they console themselves that this wasn't the main reason they gathered here for today. I strongly object. Vision was the first to object as soon as he heard what was being said. And not just him, but Steve also. The three present members of the Fantastic Four remained quiet even as the entire room devolved into a rowdy argument. Even though he had said expected something like this, he was never in favor of the Accords that now not only had the Avengers name scripted on it, but also mutants as a whole. Whether you agree to it or not doesn't matter. What matters is keeping the peace of the country and freedom to those who want to be a part of that peace. Neither Vision, Stark, Steve or even the Fantastic Four had any pulling power to change any decision given by the panel. After all adjourned meetings were concluded, the reason why they were here in the first place along with the Fantastic Four was because they had super-powered humans, mutates, who also fell into the category of mutants. At least as far as the public was concerned. You are expected to sign the accords when they are presented to the public to set the standard. Steve cut off the speaker at that point. Why are you speculating your statements as if you think we will sign it? You won't. The speaker asked in a cold tone. Steve's eyes didn't waver for a moment as he replied. Under those conditions, no. Those terms are no different than forcing them to publicity. And also the fact that they are compensation for coming out is no different than slavery or depends on how you want to interpret it, entitled prostitution. Vision added, someone finally had enough and retorted loudly for anyone to hear. Wait, I don't remember us ever granting human rights to a computer processor. He didn't. He just did Junior. Before anyone could say anything else, all the monitors and display screens in the room changed. First displaying the Avengers logo, and then abruptly changed as some displayed reports, some voice recordings, some even videos of the minister who just spoke. Crimes include rape, drug and weapons trafficking, human trafficking, 
pedophilia, assault, patricide, bribery, embezzlement, and every other petty and large crimes you can imagine a politician committing. Vision said coolly and reclined into his chair and turned to Tony. How did I do? Tony made an okay gesture with his hands. Couldn't have handled it better. Vision nodded and then faced the room full of stunned and apprehensive ministers and lawmakers, and the ghostly white minister who just stood frozen. Can we start this meeting now? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.